Now we'll do it. Thank you. I remember how a microphone works. What it was called. Uh, the meeting to order of the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission, um, starting with our favorite, uh, the COVID hybrid opening. In keeping with the Oregon Public Meetings Law, statutory land use hearing requirements in Title 33 of the Portland City Code, the Portland Planning and Sustainability Commission is holding hybrid meetings, which provides for both virtual and in-person attendance for commissioners, staff, and the public. Members of the PSC will elect to attend in per person or remotely by video and teleconference. The public uh, may watch the live stream or attend in person in the commission room at 1900 Southwest 4th Avenue, Suite 2500. Public testimony for projects that have a hearing at the PSC will be taken both in person and by electronic means. The PSC is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the continued need to limit in-person contact and promote physical distancing when warranted. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public's health, safety, and welfare. Thank you all for your patience, humor, flexibility, and understanding as we navigate this situation to do the city's business. And just a note uh, that it in person today is uh, Commissioners Jesse Gittemeyer and myself. And that I'd love to open up to um, uh, items of interest to Commissioners. Eli. <laughs> oh, sweet. Thank you, Eli. If only we were working on easy, ready code. Janelle, please, and then Kate. Awesome, thank you, Janelle. And I know that you've you've brought that up previously, and and we've brought that before staff as well. So thank you for for raising that. And um, Katie. Oh, forgive me. I, I had thought that um, that the request was to just talk um, about the people who were in person. So uh, on in virtual, thank you, Katie, uh, is just in terms of what I'm looking at, uh, Katie, Commissioners Katie Larcell, Erica Thompson, Eli Spivak, Janelle Bell, and Jeff Bacharach, and Gabe Shusips. Um, thank you. Any other items? I have one. Okay, uh, I'd love um, to uh, ask that we approve the uh, Cully TIF recommendation letter that was uh, passed around to to folks uh, via electronic communication. I don't know why I just said electronic communication um, uh, within the last week. Could anyone move? Jesse moves. Do I have a second? Erica. Um, could everyone, um, uh, everyone in favor of accepting that, uh, raise your virtual or real hands. Sweet. Thank you so much. Ta -da. 
Um, seeing no more, uh, thanks team. Uh, we'll share that uh, uh, with city council and, and put that on as part of our transmittal. Um, and with that, would love to move to uh, the director's report with Director Donnie Oliveira. All right, good evening. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Donnie Oliveira, Director of Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for the record. As JP cues up the presentation, I just want to take a moment to uh, say hi, and it's good to see you all again on, on screen and in person. Uh, acknowledging that it's been a while since I've been in front of you all. Uh, I, as I'm going to go through a little deeper dive on a director's report this evening, it's uh, been that there's been a lot of activity at BPS that I'm looking forward to share with you. Uh, I want to also take a moment really quick to thank all of you who've been participating in the work sessions on shaping the next iteration of this commission. Uh, that's a lot of additional work and investment that you're all making, and I, I can't um, express enough my gratitude for that for that investment. And I want to take a moment to thank JP, uh, Julie, Sandra, and uh, especially Patricia, our chief planner, for uh, kind of keeping the this, this ship rolling. And uh, you're in good hands, of course. So with this update, it's going to cover a few things. And I want to just take a moment to acknowledge that um, we are in a significant time of transition in the city. You're probably reading a lot in the paper about charter reform and the opportunities of what that might look like. But there's also conversations going around just the organization of the city and how we're, we're being more effective, more efficient. You may have seen an announcement uh, last week from city council about uh, a new body of work, a reorganization of body of work around housing and houselessness and economic development. And all that's uh, in tune to this idea that the city is in transition. And so with that, I'm gonna give you just a quick update on how that's um, shaping BPS. And uh, let's do that. Yeah. All right. So this update is gonna cover three areas. First, I'm gonna share with you um, some significant organizational updates at our Bureau. Um, we are the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, um, and that definition is evolving. Yep, there we go. Um, the second is I'm going to share with you a few updates on our, our policy um, at BPS that we're shaping that's uh, maybe not coming to PSC, but certainly things that you all may be interested in hearing on um, what's, um, uh, what's coming to council and just in general some projects we're working on. And then last, I think the thing that's been um, on people's mind is just really what's the next steps on, on this commission's transition, specifically the sustainability slash climate uh, commission. All right, so real quick, uh, we can talk about some organizational additions. Uh, so earlier this year, we were in uh, conversations with uh, the mayor's office and Commissioner Ruby's office about strengthening uh, the city's uh, graffiti removal program. And that looks like a transition from that program from the Office of Civic Life to uh, BPS. Uh, you may be asking, why is BPS taking on uh, this program? Well, it started with the, um, the mayor's emergency uh, declaration passed this spring that set up a new Office of, of Emer Environmental Management. Um, in that, we were participants, but we were largely focused on our trash program, public trash, um, and cleanup. There's a lot of similarities between the managing of that work and the graffiti removal program, with contract management, just the um, sort of the day-to-day -day operations and triage. And so there's an efficiency gained um, for that program by moving it into BPS. That will be managed out of our waste program by our, um, our waste operations manager, Quentin Bauer, and team. And that comes with two FTE and an operating budget of about $3.6 million. Uh, mostly in contracts for graffiti removal uh, contractors. Um, this is a sort of a hot off the press update that council will be taking action on this Thursday, but uh, as a part of the fall bump process, which is the budget monitoring process, um, uh, the Office of Community Technology will be um, merged with uh, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And that comes with three programs, digital justice, the franchise and utility, um, uh, agreements and the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. Again, the question may be asked, why is this you know, part of BPS? Uh, the Digital Justice Program actually has a significant overlap with our Smart Cities PDX program. Uh, there's a lot of, of similarities in that work, so there's a, a natural uh, synergy there. Um, we manage a franchise at BPS already with our waste program, so there is uh, already institutional uh, knowledge and, and synergy with that. Uh, we support, we'll be able to uh, provide internal services support for the OCT staff that are working on, on the code updates around the right-of-way and, um, and other related um, uh, ordinances, uh, such as uh, uh, contract agreements with utilities. We essentially, we uh, manage the other non-public utility, which is our waste program, so that's consistent. And the last one is the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. Uh, you know, BPS uh, currently um, 
oversees a couple of commissions similar to this, but also it's a, it comes with a grant program and given our institutional capacity with PCEF and the lessons we've learned through that, we'll be able to support the OCT staff in that space. And the last thing I want to acknowledge is that BPS has been going through an unprecedented um, amount of hiring. We currently have uh, 20 positions that are in the process of either applicant review or interview. We are in the negotiation phase with four positions and we just posted two more. So that's about 26 uh, people that will be joining the Bureau in the next uh, anywhere from two weeks to two months. And uh, that will be on top of the potentially the 12 FTE coming from OCT, the additional staff from graffiti removal, plus some additional staff that we expect to see on the PCEF and waste programs in uh, July of 23. BPS is experiencing uh, much needed uh, capacity growth to match the work plans that we have. All right, so we've been um, uh, pretty busy beyond the work that you all have been uh, tackling as a part of this commission. Uh, BPS has been engaged. You may have seen some of this in the paper. Uh, we've been uh, in the news uh, updating the Portland Clean Energy Funds um, code. This is really an opportunity for us to strengthen um, how we are uh, serving com communities' values and priorities by creating more flexibility within the fund uh, to ensure that we're able to, to invest at scale. Um, that there's always going to be a community responsive grant program. I want to stress that. There will always be an annual space where community organizations can activate resources through the fund to um, to prioritize the work that, that community organizations are already invested in. And with this new code update, we'll be able to focus on transportation. We'll be able to focus on targeted solicitations that'll allow us to leverage uh, other city projects to in increase capacity. So that might look like um, a tree, uh, an urban forestry uh, type solicitation. It looked like affordable housing, uh, energy efficiency upgrades, and broader scale work on transportation along um, East 82nd Avenue and potentially some other targeted uh, neighborhoods within East Portland. This is a great opportunity for us to think about how we how we do the work. We'll, this work will continue to go through the PSAF grant committee. Um, so nothing will um, happen without their guidance and directive, but this is a chance for us to, again, address the scale of the fund. Uh, for context, we were building a program that was intended to bring in revenue of 44 million, and now we're anticipating anywhere from 90 to 125 million annually. Uh, that's a much different scale and required a, a different perspective on how those resources are spent. Um, we'll, the other big change to the fund is we will be developing a climate investment plan. This will be a five-year plan that'll be set by the PCEF committee that will allow us to really set five-year goals and strategies that we can uh, have longer-term investment strategies for. Again, this is uh, to really meet the scale of the fund um, as we're now um, collecting it. The other thing I just want to acknowledge is that last last week and will be voted on tomorrow by City Council. Um, the Council announced a series of emergency ordinances or resolutions. One that's most um, uh, relevant to BPS is the housing production resolution. Within that resolution is several actions that um, BPS staff had already been working on, mainly the, uh, the planning side of the, the office. Uh, but this is really a chance for us to work with Prosper and the Housing Bureau to um, like look at the potential for housing development to really accelerate production. And from a BPS lens, we're thinking about those opportunities that we can have to increase density, uh, you know, focus on our, our corridors and, and commercial centers. We're really looking at the different ways for us to leverage the available land, um, pr perhaps create a land bank, and also just leverage our uh, existing resources around analysis and um, thinking about the ways that our, our zoning code is, is utilized to uh, maximize good housing in Portland. Um, the other part of our um, uh, shop at the climate side is I'm going to be bringing a renewable fuel standard update to City Council next month. The uh, public comment period closed for that on October 3rd. And in a nutshell, this um, new fuel standard, which is an update to one that was passed in 2006, will set a new standard for um, petroleum diesel to be phased out by um, 2030. There'll be stage gates along the way that give us a chance to evaluate the market and in terms of cost and supply. But the idea is that um, at, when this uh, code is fully updated, there will be um, no petroleum diesel sold at the pump in Portland. And last, um, our Smart Cities um, team has been, for the last couple of years, but really in the last year, focused on a new surveillance technology policy and program that would create um, a process for evaluating technology and the use of that technology in the city of Portland, specifically um, how we collect data and how the data is um, protected to ensure that our residents and our um, uh, the people of Portland understand that whenever the city collects information, we have due process to ensure that it's not um, misused. Uh, this has been uh, taking a long time to ensure that we have the right partners at the table to understand our community expectations and needs, but frankly, to get our um, procurement and BTS, our Bureau of Technology Services, on board. They've been great partners. We're just making sure that we have the sort of the scaffolding to run a program of this scale, because it's not just about the technology, it's how we use it. 
And then coming into next next year, just sort of a teaser, some of the things that you all have been working on, the EV Ready Code that you're uh, continuing that conversation tonight, the Shelter to Housing Continuum, and the Floodplain Resilience are all the planning projects that we'll see in early um, 2023. I want to just make sure we're acknowledging those. Um, and then a couple of other um, significant policies um, that will be coming to council um, next year will be the Residential Waste Franchise Review. This is our um, every once in a while moment that we get to reflect on what's working for our, our this is single family up to four units um, uh, waste franchise that we can look at things like uh, service standards um, and like I think uh, uh, Eli in the past has mentioned, you know, like thinking about EVs for the trucks. These are this is that opportunity for us to evaluate changes to that significant system. So this doesn't include commercial, doesn't include multifamily, but is a pretty significant um, opportunity for us to evaluate that uh, that program. And then another program that's been a couple of years in the making, as far as policy goes, is the building performance standards. Um, this is a, a co-development with in co-creation with community partners on building standards. Uh, that will really kind of shape the way that we are able to uh, meet our climate goals through the existing um, buildings, whether it be uh, f commercial or multifamily. I'm looking forward to um, continue to share that the, the work that our, our climate team is doing because it's such a, a genuine effort to work with community to um, to co-create something that is um, both um, equity centered, but also like really some of the like the highest standards of building uh, performance that um, in the country. And with that. I'm going to pause for a second. Um, I, don't, I want to spend some time on this, but I want to make sure I leave some space. I'm covering a lot of ground fast for questions on anything I just shared. Questions, team? Jeff. All right. That came in. Did anybody catch that? That was choppy to me. Forgive me, Jeff. Were you talking about the housing production strategy? You were in and out. Absolutely, and if I didn't acknowledge them, that was a huge um, oversight. Yes, the Housing Bureau is very much involved, um, as, lo as well as BDS. Great. Way to stick with Jeff. Oriana. <laughs> That's a great question, Oriana. Thank you. So, it some of the growth um, is on, in one-time funding. So we're being very being strategic about that. Well, we can start with that. We are uh, trying, and this is one of those challenges, to not uh, bring forward po policies or programs that we can't actually implement. So we don't want to develop unfunded mandates that you know it's. We get, you know, there's a lot of urgency to advance our, our climate policies, for example, but we just don't have the staff capacity to always implement that. So that's that's constantly on our mind. It is a constant evaluation. I know um, Patricia can acknowledge this from the planning side as well. Um, it's great to get one-time funds, but there's a lot of time needed to invest to get staff up to speed and running, and then and the, the funding is gone. So how are we ensuring that those resources are um, um, 
are strategic in, in terms of how we implement them. Um, so the last thing I'll just say is yes, although the growth is important and we are going to have sustainable resources from both PCEF and the Solid Waste Management Fund to support some of this work, the truth is um, our, both our climate and planning um, functions still need additional ongoing resources. And I think uh, tapping general fund is just unlikely, so we're going to have to start getting creative about what that looks like. So there's obviously going to be IRA or you know the Inflation Reduction Act resources. What does that look like? Um, but again, one-time funding. So there is a long-term strategy that we're still um, uh, constantly evaluating about that. But thanks for flagging. Great. Thank you. Eli? There is, a, I'll acknowledge that um, we're re evaluating the resolution as an aspirational goal. So if you, when you look at the resolution, it talks about 20,000 affordable units um, in the city. And, um, and then there's some ongoing work that's also acknowledged that we're already working on. Through RECAP, um, a project that um, Sandra Wood has been, been leading with other partner bureaus, um, and a couple of other projects that are already on our plate. There will certainly be some Title 33 updates. What that looks like will be, you know, a, a development process that staff does with, with community partners and other bureaus. But yes, I mean, that's the BPS role will be, you know, Title 33 to um, leverage our tools to increase opportunities. I actually have a question about the surveillance technology. Mm -hmm. How many bureaus does that, because there's, there's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> of bureaus that retain a lot of information and, and also through franchises. So I'm curious, like, what, how many bureaus and, you know, is there, uh, is that an ongoing or is there a, a specific project that has a process timeline? Thank you. Great question, uh, Chair. The, the surveillance policy, it's a policy and a program, meaning that once the policy is in place, what it's really setting up is, um, in theory, programmatic infrastructure that allows for an assessment to be done when a purchase is made of technology, an assessment to be done of how that technology is utilized, and then a, an assessment of how the data once collected is being uh, protected, leveraged, um, un what are the unintended consequences of that data being collected. So there are several stop gaps in the process um, once this policy is in place. Uh, we are deliberately working through with our partner bureaus to ensure that they have capacity because it's not just a smart cities PDX role to play or procurement or the Bureau of Technology Services. We need all bureaus to participate because every bureau is buying technology and how they do that and how they leverage it is um, really critical. For example, um, technology inherently isn't bad. It's how it's used. I mean, the most extreme example of that is uh, drones were, you know, were once a toy and now they're being used for nefarious purposes. So it's not just the technology, it's how it's used. So the process, the, the policy is, is very in depth in that way. So uh, the short answer is yes, every bureau would be participating um, in this. Thank you. Um, see also the Gutenberg Press, I mean, also nefarious purpose. Uh, any other questions before we go to commission update? Jeff has his hand up. Oh, I can't Jeff, tell. is that an old hand or a new hand? Ah, old hand. All right, um, so maybe we can share the screen again. All right, so the, the next uh, part of this update that I wanted to take some time to walk through with you all, I know these conversations have been happening. I want to take a moment to thank you all again, uh, Patricia, Sandra, Julie, uh, for your leadership in working through the, the Planning Commission work sessions. Um, I wanted to just kind of walk through so we're all on the same page about the next steps because I know there's been questions about that. Um, so. As we sit here as the Planning and Sustainability Commission, um, we're working through a process to develop code amendments for the next Planning Commission. And uh, so what that looks like right now is you all will take up in your first hearing on November 8th, those code amendments. Um, and I think this is, this is pretty known information. I think what's maybe not new per se, but specific is that starting in December, we will um, uh, begin the recruitment for the next Planning Commission um, membership. And we'll talk about the role for PSC members in that uh, shortly. Um, January 18th is the tentative date for which City Council will take the amendments passed by this commission to um, adopt. And we will expect to appoint the new planning commission uh, commissioners in February of 2023 with um, the, the planning commission becoming effective in March. And so that's a pretty aggressive timeline that you all I think we're aware of. I just want to make sure we're on the same page about that. But the question I know that's coming up frequently is what's, what about the sustainability slash climate commission. Um, before I dive into some of the, the, the next steps on this, I just want to um, 
kind of acknowledge that we did intentionally slow down the process of this as the Charter Commission uh, was reflecting on potential charter um, code updates that may have uh, resulted in the creation of a commission. So until they had worked through that, it was premature for us to embark on our process. But we were still behind the scenes uh, getting the scaffolding together to start this process. But now we have clarity on where they're going so we can say definitively that this is our process. So um, much like uh, Chief Planner, um, Patricia Diefendorf has been leading the planning commission process. Our new chief sustainability officer will lead the sustainability commission process. It's a parallel. It makes sense. Uh, we are in the middle of um, the hiring process, and we hope to have a... Um, uh, CSO um, starting in December. Um, simultaneously, um, we'll be um, beginning the, the working group recruitment. That This is going to be the people that work on developing what the next commission is. And this is where it's going to be a slight departure from the planning commission process in that there are so many people across our city that are very interested in this commission. And that's a good thing. There's a lot of existing commissions. There's a lot of bureaus, uh, community partners that would love to have a role in shaping not just the scope, but um, where this commission sits, how it functions within the city, what it's going to look like post-November election on charter reform. So I think this is a totally appropriate moment for us to build a, a working group that's reflective of the different perspectives of, of this work in our city. Um, the other part is, I shared this in an email, but we, we are staffing this commission up with a staffer. And so that, that position is posted. It's live. We'd love for you all to um, share that with your networks. Um, that person will be in, in, you know, starting in January to s support the CSO and the working group to get the commission up and running. And along with the announcement of the planning commission in February, we, we would love to be able to announce the working group members formally. So once that recruitment's completed, uh, kind of kick off that process roughly around the same time of March. I didn't include that, but March would be sort of the target date to start the working group. Um, we understand that there's there's concern about the gap in sustainability work coming to a, an advisory body as this is happening. Um, I want to just really emphasize that uh, along the way, there's other bodies that are tackling these issues. They're not com comprehensive, absolutely not. But we want to just um, emphasize that this, we feel like this is the appropriate pathway to ensure that we have all the inputs necessary to have this commission um, as strong as possible. So I think the, the thing that we really have in daylit um, publicly, but this is really important for you all to track, is um, we are hoping that sometime next month, current PSC members will convey your intentions about where you'd like to go. It's a choose your own adventure moment. Um, as the PSC is sunset and at the end of February, um, we're hoping um, significantly before February to get a sense of where you all would like to go. So I want to be as clear as possible. Um, we are hoping for some continuity from the PSC, the Planning Commission. So we would like to have current PSC missioners um, who are interested, of course, uh, consider um, participating in the next planning commission. So there is, uh, Commissioner Rubio has identified an interest in ensuring that those of you that are interested in being on that commission have an opp opportunity to do so. So there would be a pathway for that. So if you're interested in the planning commission, there's a pathway for you to move from the PSC, the current PSC to the planning commission in March. For those of you that are not interested, but are interested in the sustainability climate uh, commission. Um, we'd like to have you all participate in that working group. Again, there'll be a seat for you there if you'd like it. Um, I want to just be really clear, um, given that we don't know where that commission is going to go as far as the development in the process, uh, we cannot guarantee a seat on that commission at this time. Um, and of course, the third option, I guess, is you could sign off at the PSC at the end of February and uh, tip of the cap to you all if you do that. Um, but that would be your, your third option if you chose to not participate in either the other two processes. So I just want to make sure that there's clarity here that you do have pathways. One's more you know explicit to be on the commission for the planning side and the sustainability climate side is a little bit more of a work in progress. Looks like Erica has her hand raised. Erica? That's a great question. I, I think we were um, working on the uh, with the expectation that would be a, an either or scenario. I mean, I guess there is a scenario where someone could be on the planning commission and be really committed to the other one and, and join. But I think we're, we're working from the assumption that there's um, probably a one or the other. Mm -hmm. Other questions, thoughts? Cool. All right.
Oh, uh, Eli? Oh, Eli. This is this, this the end. Yeah, we can stop sharing. Thank you, Eli. Any others? Questions, thoughts? Donnie, thank you so much for the thank you. comprehensive uh, blockbuster. Yeah, long overdue. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank I you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and and I recognize that we're a little uh. A little past time so uh and, and another next is is a hearing so um uh to those who have uh signed up to test testify grateful for your patience um before we move on to uh we still um would love to approve the october 11th minutes if someone would be willing to make a motion for that consentogen jesse we have a second Thank you, Ariana. Um, could everyone raise your virtual or real hands? Do, 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 do. I see it as uh, unanimous. I believe. Yes. Thank you. Um, all right. And with that, thanks for your patience, team. No problem. Thank uh, you. Love to go to our next, which is the street vacation request of Southwest Greenleaf Court East of Southwest Greenleaf Drive. And uh, I believe Lance Lindahl and Claudia Echeverria. Yes. Anaya. Yes. Great. Thank you. <laughs> you should have asked previously and I did not. Please you, take it away. You got it. Well, thank you uh, for having us here tonight. Um, my name is Lance Lindahl, and with me today is Claudia Echeverria, and we are from Peabot Right of Way Acquisition, and we're here to discuss the proposed vacation of a portion of Southwest Greenleaf Court, east of Southwest Greenleaf Drive. And uh, bear with me one moment here. I'll get the. Uh, PowerPoint uh, <laughs> presentation going. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the share button. Let me see. Okay. Sorry. There we go. And then maximize that probably. Or yeah. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can see that now. All right, so this section of street is currently unimproved, it is not open to through traffic, and this vacation will create two dead-end segments of public street, and that's actually the reason why we wanted to bring this before you tonight and um, have a little time discussing it. Um, typically, Peabot does not uh, support vacations where this type of end result comes forward. Um, this one's a little bit different though. Um, there's really steep elevation changes in this area. And um, as I'll talk to later, the uh, petitioner who's one of the abutting property owners has um, really taken this on. They went through the full petition process on this vacation and um, they've had a number of concerns about the current right of way out there. Um, Claudia, do you want to take the next slide? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, that's not a the button. Yeah, you'll need to press the button. To, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, so here's an... You gotta hold it, I think. Oh, yep. hold it? Sorry. It's not on? 
Oh, okay. Hello? Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Here's an aerial image showing the surrounding area. This is a residential neighborhood in the Portland Heights portion of Southwest Portland. This is Northwest of Council Crest Park. Here's a recent photo showing the area to be vacated in the distance. This is from Southwest Greenleaf Court to the left. As you can see, there is a steep grade difference here in the area to be vacated. There is a 30 foot, 35 foot drop from east to west ends of the vacation area. Thank you, Claudia. Um, here's a uh, excuse me. Here's a photo of the vacation area from the opposite end, on the east side. Um, the petitioner has requested the vacation to consolidate property so that his driveway can be gated off and a private fence can be constructed. Uh, this driveway is currently within the public right of way, and the petitioner reports that drivers are often directed to um, use this street as a shortcut through the neighborhood, and they end up going down his driveway, which comes to um, a, an abrupt end, <laughs> right at a big elevation change, and that he and his neighbors have had to come out and um, direct traffic and have them back up, and depending where other people park, it's a really tight fit to, to get out of this spot once you're into it. And again, if you look at the right of way map right now, um, it does just you know appear as right of way. It's hard. A lot of times, Google Maps and other sources don't really map out whether the street's improved and open to traffic. Uh, city bureaus are in support of this street vacation. Um, they've responded with uh, just a couple minor conditions of approval. Development for services is requiring a replat to um, consolidate lots so that historic lot lines are um, removed so that all the remaining legal lots will have um, legal frontage onto the right of way. And also the Bureau of Environmental Services is requiring that uh, a 15 foot wide easement is granted for an existing sewer line and maintenance hole. And you can see that in this image. Um, it's a real small area there on the east end of the vacation area. And it's my understanding the representative of the petitioner has signed up to testify tonight. And also Claudia and I are available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, shall we go to hearing first? Um, oh, Erica, do you have a clarifying question? Mm-hmm. Um, right now, it really can't even drive into the, the vacation area, which is highlighted in yellow here. Um, so basically, the street turns into a driveway that then kind of bends to the north and uh, connects to the, you, you can see the, uh, the aerial view of the, the, the two residences here. And uh, past that point, yeah, it just, it, it ends pretty abruptly. Oh, sure thing. Um, I just had a question about the opposite end. Um, the uh, barrier is even more pronounced on the west end. So you'll see the other street, uh, which is also named Southwest Greenleaf, running north-south. And then, and, and that's pretty much it. You know, it curves up to the west as you get to the north end here. But um, th yeah, there's no improved right-of-way at all to go easterly. Um, you have to just continue northwards or southwards. Um, I guess I, I, I have a, one more clarifying question, and thanks. Sure. Uh, is, are we talking about an unimproved roadway that is passable, or are we talking about paper street? This is a paper street. Okay. Um, it's not passable to vehicle traffic, and oh. because of the steep grade changes, um, that the possibility of constructing even a pedestrian trail here, it's very limited. It would have to be like a stairway type situation, which would be very expensive. Thank you. Um, any other clarifying questions before we... Um, Eli. Yeah, actually, um, development services are a real watchdog on this issue, and um, they require that, um, that that situation not come up. So in this case, the properties to both the north and the south will have to go through lot consolidations to make sure that they all have legal frontage under the current uh, standard requirements. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, um, we would love to open it to testimony. Um, I believe Danelle Eisenhart 
Um, and forgive me if, oh, actually, could you promote? I do not have capability. Thanks, Jamie. And there you are, uh, Danelle Eisenhart. Can we hear you? Great. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and with that, we will uh, close testimony um, and would love any thoughts. And poor um, Jeff Bacharach is going to sign off due to poor internet connection um, and apologizes for technology. Um, thoughts. And or propose Jesse. Um, I'm just curious if this will have any impact on like the trees that are currently there. Is that something that now the owners will have the possibility of taking out those trees or what does that look like? So we have urban forestry review all of our street vacation proposals that move forward. And um, they came back with no comments of concern on this one. And um, yeah, uh, upon completion of the vacation process, then this area will revert back to the property owners to the north and south, and then they'll be subject to the regulations um, for the residential zone in this area. Eli? I believe you're right, Eli. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you, Erica. Uh, well, to clarify, um, currently um, drivers can drive into um, the edge of the vacation area. They come to a dead end. Um, they cannot continue out to any other public right of way. So that leaves them kind of stuck. Um, the driveway that's there now, as well as some other landscaping improvements and such, are in the public right of way. And um, to gate off the public right of way is not allowed under current city code and practices. So the only way for them to really, excuse me, them being the adjacent property owners, the only way for them to really kind of put in a fence or a gate that would really kind of mark the area as not safe to drive through would be to um, go through the vacation process so that it becomes uh, private property again. Yeah, my understanding is the driveway just extends into um, a small portion of the uh, east end of the vacation area. What? Yeah. Yes, please do. Oh. They're working on it. Hold on. I have to make you a co-host. One moment. No, no, no. Uh-oh. And I just did the wrong thing. Okay. Where'd she go? All right. 
Danelle, you should be able to do that now. Yes, we can see it. Thank you for sharing the site plan. It's very helpful. Even having been out there in person, it's really difficult to tell where the uh, private and public realms uh, meet and diverge out there. Yeah. Yep. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah, that was helpful for me too. Thank you because um, I remember in a, a previous project, uh, we had talked about wildfire um, zones and evacuation, especially in this area. So the idea of uh, of vacating a street um, when we are talking about potentially shifting um, zoning code because of uh, lack of, of evacuation route, um, those things to, seem to be in conflict. So yeah. um, does anyone... Have anything? Would anyone like to uh, share? Pro uh, propose to um, to move the street vacation. Wait, um, I'm seeing Eli as a motion, uh, and oh wait, I'm sorry, Eli as a question. Great, thank you. And Erica, is that great? Okay, um, shall we call the roll, JP, please? All right. Uh, Commissioner Thompson. Commissioner Spivak. Commissioner Magnera. Commissioner Showships. Commissioner Bell. Commissioner Larcel. Commissioner Gittemeyer? Yes. And Chair Routh? Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you yes, both. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you, um, Ingrid Fish and Phil Namany, for your patience as we uh, move to our next agenda item, which is EV Ready Code. We're just getting settled here, switching the guards. And now there's a back pocket item. So there's that. Okay, there's that. Okay. And then here's this. Great. So you'll need to just share it like you're doing some. Okay. I'll just say it's it's lovely to see um, <clears throat> so many of our commissioners' faces. Thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you, commissioners. Um, good evening. I'm Sandra Wood with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, and we are here for continuation of the EV um, or electric vehicle ready code project. I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, Ingrid Fish and um, Phil Namany, and we've been here a few times. So just to recap what we've done before for this project, this is a zoning code amendment project. We were here in September for a public hearing and you heard testimony and you closed the oral and written record. And we had a work session on October 11th and we discussed several items. 
Um, and subsequent to that discussion where the commissioners got on the same page, um, a few commissioners have been working with um, Ingrid and Phil to um, craft some amendments that we um, published um, a few days ago. So on October 21st, we sent you a memo and we're gonna be working off that memo today. We don't have um, a PowerPoint presentation because it's just code language and um, Phil's gonna walk you through that. And what we're hoping to do is um, probably, I think, take them one by one so we can describe what the amendment idea is and he'll share what the code language is and um, you can you know, move and vote on each code amendment and then we can vote on the whole, whole package. So that's what we have planned today. I hope that's what you are all expecting <laughs> and it's no surprise to anybody. So I'll turn it over to Phil to walk us through it. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, and good evening, um, Commissioner Routh and PSC members. Uh, Phil Namany with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability and the Code Development Group. Uh, and Ingrid is here uh, with uh, from the uh, climate and sustainability side of things. And uh, before I start sharing the memo that we released, I do want to spend just a couple minutes uh, providing a little more background because I think there was uh, definitely some discussions that happened behind the scenes uh, right after our October 11th. Uh, work session uh, that that really helped inform our first our first of the three amendments, which is related to the landscaping provision there for uh, EV chargers and the equipment. Uh, and just to kind of go back in time a little bit, uh, there was some conversations about what kind of uh, requirements the electrical code may have in terms of um, electrical uh, protection of electrical live electrical uh, facilities. Uh, there was also some questions about how Title 33, the zoning code, and Title 11, the tree code, interact. Uh, those were sort of the, the main things. We didn't touch on that a whole lot with the memo, just to kind of try to keep the memo brief. But I did want to mention that we did have conversations with, I think, four of the PSC members via email on that. And uh, just for transparency's sake, I wanted to, to kind of summarize that. Uh, First off, with the electrical code, we did have some conversations with Brian Kreiss, our, our uh, electrical inspector. And while there is um, provisions in the electrical code that you protect live electrical devices or facilities from being run over, uh, there's no specific um, criteria. There's no specific spacing. It's uh, sort of done by, you know, an applicant will propose something, the inspector will go out there and take a look and determine whether it's sufficient or not. And uh, they can use you know, an assortment of bollards, uh, tire stops, uh, they can put all the equipment in cabinets, things like that. So uh, it's a little open-ended, so that didn't necessarily help provide an actual amount of spacing that maybe we would need in terms of the distance to the landscaping. Um, so I wanted to just touch on that. The other um, main thing we are talking uh, had discussions about was how Title 11, the tree protect, you know, tree code, which includes tree protection and the Title 33 parking lot landscaping uh, intertwine. Uh, one thing we did notice, uh, especially in conversations with BDS, was that Title 11's tree protection doesn't actually, you don't even have to show trees on the site if they're under 12 inches diameter. So oftentimes parking lots get renovated, changed, and uh, it's not that often that we even find trees of that kind of diameter in the parking lot. Um, if there are trees in the parking lot that are proposed to be removed that are over 12 inches in diameter, uh, generally they're supposed to show them and they, they are supposed to preserve one third of those. So once again, it's not a high bar to, uh, to achieve. So in most cases when a parking lot is being renovated or in a case like this, if say, uh, EV uh, chargers and equipment are going into the parking lot. It's usually the, the parking and landscaping provisions in the zoning code that, that apply, because those do have spacing requirements for new trees uh, based upon the size of the tree. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there because that helped um, inform kind of what we then proposed with our first amendment. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, share the memo. The uh, one other thing I wanna mention is We've had some conversations um, since this memo got released, uh, both internally and also with Commissioner Thompson. And she brought up a good point with one of our proposals. And so we're gonna share the memo and we're gonna stop. 
and show, uh, show a, a quick addendum to that memo that kind of we would like to replace one section of the code. So as we had kind of talked about it on the 11th, there were sort of three amendments that were agreed upon. I think the first one was the, the, the one substan substantial, well, I don't know if we'd call it substantial, but the one amendment that has some, some meat to it. Uh, and that was to kind of look at potentially allowing the electric vehicle chargers and the equipment to be placed in a portion of the perimeter parking lot landscaping. And that's the required perimeter parking lot landscaping. We have certain minimums. We also had an amendment to uh, include electric bike chargers in the list uh, along with EV charging uh, facilities as something that doesn't count towards your um, dollar amount that you look at for non-conforming uh, upgrades. So it, it exempts that provision. And that third one was a staff amendment um, that was removing some code based upon what's happening with the uh, DLCD with their climate friendly and uh, equitable communities rulemaking. So for the first one, as I mentioned, you know, we originally proposed uh, that the, both the chargers and the equipment could not go into the perimeter parking lot landscaping, which is five feet in most zones in a couple of the um, employment industrial zones, it is 10 feet. Uh, and the idea was to kind of keep the purpose of that landscaping intact in terms of its screening provisions, um, uh, sh shading of the parking lot, and potentially storm water. Um, during the work session, the, the uh, PSC members did uh, have expressed an interest in, in increasing the flexibility of placement of those potentially in a part of that landscaping. Uh, as I mentioned, we did some research about whether there's any kind of requirements in terms of where bollards go and things like that and, and found that it's fairly open-ended. Uh, we also talked to uh, BDS at this point uh, about what they thought was sort of a minimum viable uh, landscape strip to still maintain shrubs and, and potentially tre occasional trees and, and they did feel that keeping a three-foot open strip was, was uh, sort of the minimum viable amount. So what we have done is we've uh, made some changes to allow both the equipment, uh, the chargers and the equipment to, uh, to go into the landscape strip up to two feet of that uh, total landscape strip. And this requires a few changes. So I'm kind of scrolling into the code. The first change I want to get at is we, of course, have this long uh, drawn out <clears throat> set of purpose statements for why we why we regulate parking and why we regulate development standards and landscaping around parking. And one of the things we had added at the time was something about addressing electric vehicle chargers. And because we're <clears throat> provide, uh, providing more flexibility of where they can go and we're allowing them to go into the perimeter landscape strip, we did make a slight change to that last bullet point on the purpose statement. So I just wanted to indicate that so that that, uh, that got expanded a little bit uh, to allow for the fact that there is some flexibility, but if somebody wanted to get an adjustment to say, go all the way into the five foot landscape strip, they would still have to show through that adjustment how they're continuing to meet this purpose statement. So that is that is the you know change number one with the first change. Uh, the other thing we wanted to, to uh, spell out was we noticed uh, within the, the setback requirements there was provisions that say that protective curbs, tire stops, and bollards or other protective barriers are not allowed in those setbacks. And since we were allowing, wanting to allow both the, the chargers and any kind of bollard to be in that setback, um, we did have to add a little note about referencing to this other section that we've been adding. So though that was also the other change for this first section. And now I'm gonna pivot to the other um, other code addendum, and let me see. When I pivot, does that does that show up, or do I need yeah, to you'll stop have to sharing? Share okay. And -share. Let me stop sharing, and let me then. So the last major change was this new section H, and what we did here is the items in the gray was part of what we had originally. Included in our Evolution addendum. Zoom in. Oh yeah. Okay. 
Okay, does that work? Hopefully does that, that works for everybody at home. Um, so the, the items in gray was what we had proposed to change with our amendment memo. And one thing that we realized, I was also working with our code editor and realized that there was some language that was almost getting a little too prescriptive. Um, and I also noticed that there's a period here that I'll have to change at the end here. Um, but one of the things also that Commissioner Thompson brought up was that we use the term project, that these, these chargers and equipment cannot project more than two feet into required perimeter landscaping area. And that, that actually, if you do look at the code, both project um, and extend are terms we use often to mean something's in the right spot, but it's projecting. And, and sometimes it doesn't mean it's overhanging, but sometimes like, like extending also can mean it can be in the ground. But the idea that we realized was that some of these chargers might just be completely located in that two foot strip. A level two charger doesn't take up a lot of room. Uh, some of these may actually have a part of it that's part of the parking lot and then projects into that two foot. So we changed the, the provision that says, you know, the chargers, accessory equipment, protective areas cannot be located more than two feet into required perimeter landscaping areas. So it was a change to, to address that. Um, the other things that are in yellow were some more technical changes after I went on went out of town for the weekend and had a thought chance to think about it and we looked at this and realized that we were being a little too prescriptive in some of our provisions about how something is located within or adjacent to a parking area and it i the thing i was a little bit worried about was that somebody could put it, potentially interpret that the accessory equipment always had to be immediately adjacent to a parking space or a parking area and i don't that's not my intent my intent is, you know, you can do that as long as you're not locating it more than two feet into the perimeter. But if you want to put your accessory equipment next to the building or in the building, you know, you're you're able to do that. So that was what the other section here in yellow was to uh, to uh, to get at. So that's the the gist of the first amendment. So I think I'll stop here and see if there's any questions, and then I believe we would vote to determine whether to accept the amendment. Eli, and I just want to, I, I believe we're going to be doing s straw polls of the, or are we doing actual vote each? We're doing amendment. actual okay. votes today. Mm -hmm. And then the full package. Okay, great. Thank yes. you, Eli. Thank I think what I've seen is, is um, it kind of depends on the, the size of the installation and what they're what they're removing. So if they're if they're coming in and especially with those uh, fast chargers, if they're coming with a fast charger with with a, uh, a piece of equipment that's being that's big enough that it's having to be put on a concrete foundation, and then there's some additional equipment that's getting placed in the parking lot and getting fenced off. Uh, I've seen building permits for those. So some of the ones that we, the photos that we showed examples like in the Fred Meyer parking lots and things like that, or other, you know, Winco, I think has one. They, they actually came in for a building permit and the, a planning and zoning person actually reviewed that. Great, thank you, Eli. Erica? Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, um, JP, could you do the honors? Oh, please.
Great. Janelle, thank you. And I should have called for um, disclosures. So <laughs> that's on me. Um, great. Uh, thank you, JP. Okay. So Commissioner Backrack's gone. He stepped away, correct? Correct. All right. Um, Commissioner Bell, do you want to just vote in abstention or not vote? I think he's recusing. Okay. Recuse. Commissioner Meyer. And, and, uh, can I just clarify oh. that an abstention counts as a no vote, but but for the record, we can put it as abstaining. Mm -hmm. It's a recusal, not an abstention. Just a point of order. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Commissioner Gittemeyer. Yes. Commissioner Larcel. Commissioner Magnera. Commissioner Routh. Chair Routh. Yes. Commissioner Showships. Shoe Ships. I thought I was doing it right. Uh, Commissioner Spivak. And Commissioner Thompson. Thank you. All right. Cool. On to the next. Thank you. And that's actually probably the hardest one of, that we're going through. Um, let me go ahead and bring up, reshare the screen here. So the Second Amendment was originally, I think, something that was brought forward by Commissioner Spivak and uh, was the idea that <clears throat> in this list of items that we feel create a public good, we would remove, uh, we would not count those towards the dollar amount that somebody has to calculate for determining how much non-conforming upgrades they have to provide. And so the provision, you know, we were proposing initially that electric vehicle um, chargers and equipment would create a public good, and so we were taking that out. And there was a request to also include uh, electric bike chargers. And so if you go through the actual code change, the item here that's being added was basically just adding the term electric bike and electric vehicle chargers. So that is uh, the amendment, is just the part in gray. Uh, the, the rest of item 10 was a, a part of our initial proposal. So that uh, I will stop right there and see if there's any discussion or else we can go to vote. Any thoughts? Questions, would someone like to make a motion? Jesse makes a motion. Eli, great. Um, any further discussion before we go to a vote? Sweet. JP. All right. So, uh, Commissioner Gittemeyer. Yes. Commissioner Larcel. Commissioner Magnero. Comm Chair Routh. Yes. Commissioner Shoeships. Commissioner Spivak. Commissioner Thompson. All right. All right. Good team. Okay. I guess I should stop sharing for the vote, but uh, well, um, <laughs> this way I don't have to bumble around through the sharing part again. So amendment number three, this was a technical amendment that we had uh, mentioned on the um, during the work session on October 11th, I think it was. And what we're basically doing is a provision that we were originally proposing to add some words to. We've decided not to do that because it was applying to a standard that reduces someone's minimum parking requirement. And with the changes that are happening at the state level with DLCD, Department of land conservation development uh, with their um, 
gosh, climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking. I, I always stumble over that. Um, we're looking at, you know, just a few months later, probably coming back to you with some uh, code changes that will completely remove this section. So we didn't think it was worthwhile to put in something in code that was going to get removed. So there's really nothing to show here on the code. Um, item D is still turning into item E, I believe, because there was uh, so, a, a, another provision before that. But essentially, we did have a, a, a new number three that was requiring that the car sharing spaces have a level two charger, and we're just remove, removing that back out. So um, the amendment is to basically make no amendment, and so I will stop there. Real good. Okay. I believe that's the end of amendments. Was it, was that was that, not an amendment? That's that's the third amendment. Oh, so, that was yeah. So go oh, ahead and go from e. and discuss and. Motion and second, and all that. Erica? Great. And Eli, I think you were, yep. <laughs> Any um, discussion? And I should just also, who plan fast and loose, uh, disclose that I was part of the CFEC uh, rulemaking advocacy to remove parking minimums. Commissioner Rounds, uh, or, or, Patricia Diefender, for just for the record, before we take the vote, I think that um, Commissioner Bell had mentioned that he was um, wanting to recuse himself. I think that um, it, it is it is possible that it's not necessary to recuse, rather just to disclose, as you just did. Um, but it you know it's possible that it it's. Um, not a conflict of interest it's more of a disclosure and so if i just wanted to put that out there that maybe we could have a quick discussion on that as to whether a vote on on commissioner bell's part would be appropriate or not okay sure um and Orion, i see your hand could do you mind if we move to this for a moment is that okay commissioner bell please Yeah, I think that's, um, Commissioner Bell, I think that's consistent with what, with what we've done in practice at the PSC. Because the PSC isn't the decision-making body and it's city council, PSC members would have a only a potential conflict of interest. And so how we've been advised in the past is to disclose that with votes. Um, and you have disclosed that. So I'm, I think we're comfortable with you participating. We're just <laughs> making sure you could participate fully. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I just want to, um, if... I had heard Commissioner Bell you saying that you wished to recuse, and so I would, you know, that that there are options, and that if if that is a commissioner's preference, that is also available to them. Okay. Um. Anything else on that before we go to Oriana? Oriana, please. Awesome. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, any other discussion before we go to vote? Great. JP, thanks. Commissioner Bell. Okay. Commissioner Gindemeyer. Yes. Commissioner Larcel. Commissioner Magnera. Chair Routh. Yes. Commissioner Shoeships. Commissioner Spivak. And Commissioner Thompson. Great. I believe that was our third and final. That is our third and final. So we can go all Yeah, package. that was for the full package. 
Right? I think we can. Oh, that that was that for was the, that was the for third. the tech amendment, the third amendment. So now we're going to vote on the full package as amended. Right, Jesse. Yeah, I'm going to motion to adopt the proposed draft as amended. Can we do that? Yes, please. Would anyone like to second? Who has not seconded already this evening? Okay. <laughs> okay. Lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, any final discussion before we go on? Lovely. JP. Thank you. Commissioner Bell. Commissioner Gidmeyer. Yes. Commissioner Larcel. Commissioner Magnera. Chair Routh. I just want to thank staff again um again as as we were talking before this is a dynamic environment um um who knows what is happening in in the future so the fact that that we're um we have spent so much time with so many hypotheticals uh and including e-bike charging um just really appreciate it and i vote aye right uh commissioner shoe ships commissioner spivak and Commissioner Thompson. Yay! <laughs> the package passes, right? The motion passes. Yes. Yes. It does. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Commissioners. Before Please. we let you go, um, we will be needing to draft your um, letter, transmittal letter to City Council. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity to. Share your thoughts with us on anything you think the letter should include. Of course, it'll include the commission's vote and the main parts of the recommendation. But um, if there's anything else you think we should include in the letter, we'd love to hear it. Oh, thank you, Sandra. Um, thoughts? I would go with while, um, while Erica is chewing um, uh, perhaps <laughs> some deliberation over the, um, uh, some of the competing priorities, particularly in the landscape area would be useful. Just like there's a, there's a lot of needs in a, in a small little strips of real estate. Is that okay? Eric? Mm -hmm. <laughs> cool, thank you. Thank you. I think also mentioning um, some of the back and forth around e-bike might be warranted. Because I imagine it might also end up in testimony in city council. Anything okay. else? Thoughts? Great. Thank you Thanks. so much. And if something else comes up, you know how to get in touch with us. Email Phil. That would probably be your best, your best bet. Thank you, commissioners. And we look forward to representing you at city council in this vote. Okay. Thank you all. Great. And we are, how did it happen that we're ahead of schedule um, to our last agenda item, which is, yeah, <laughs> JP's like, yes. Um, and also appreciate in disclosures and some of the messiness um, that comes from a hybrid environment and, and appreciate everyone's ongoing grace for that. So please, uh, Sally Edmonds and uh, Jeff Cottle, if you would join us for the floodplain resilience plan. And if one of, yeah, we're done, thank you. <laughs> While they're getting situated, does anyone have any disclosures about floodplain resilience plan? Thanks to Jesse for reminding. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think we're getting situated here in um, in chambers. If you want to, like a one minute stretch, one two minute stretch break. Let's take a three minute stretch break. We'll come back at six thirty.
liaison or even two for uh, PSC members to the uh, Budget Advisory Committee. Um, and our current plan is for one meeting in November, two in December, and one or two in January, especially given the um, the amount of change and growth. Um, it sounds like it would be um, a really exciting, uh, potentially unprecedented Budget Advisory Committee. So action-packed, uh, if you'd like to be a liaison. And the other, um, as we, uh, before I turn it over, is uh, uh, related to Shelter to Housing Continuum Project. Um, our oral his uh, testimony for this project closed. A reminder, um, on October 11th, uh, written testimony closed on Friday. Um, and so uh, we're, we're getting ready for that um, in our next episode. So please, floodplain team, take it away. Thank you for being here. OK. Hello, everyone. Um, Back again, my name is Jeff Cottle. I'm an environmental planner at BPS. Um, and I guess I can go ahead and share this, my presentation. I am joined by Sally Edmonds, as you know, from uh, BPS. Uh, to my left is Caitlin Lovell from Bureau of Environmental Services. And then we also have two staff from Bureau of Development Services, Jason Butler Brown, who just waved. Hi, Jason, and uh, Nancy Thorrington, who will talk about uh, some of the building code changes, Title 24 changes, or project, excuse me. So let me do this. Okay, so this is our agenda. It's, a, it's chock full of good stuff tonight. Um, lots of things to respond to related to questions that were raised uh, at the hearing. Um, some additional information on the biological opinion, which just to provide a little bit more clarity for folks, uh, both the commission and um, for people who might be watching. Um, uh, some specifics on kind of just typical uh, potential effects of our plan proposals on some projects, again, for clarity um, and just to uh, cl clarify those, uh, the proposals. Um, some information on our public testimony that we had at our hearing on September 27th. Um, and then a few other miscellaneous items, um, again, that were requested for just a little bit inf more information. Columbia Corridor non-industrial lands, which we talked uh, briefly about uh, last, uh, as a, after the hearing. Uh, as I said, Title 24 building code updates, and then um, Caitlin is here to discuss a little bit about the uh, mitigation bank work that we have been uh, collaborating on with Bureau of Environmental Services. And then finally, we have some staff recommended amendments, which we provided as uh, so all this all kind of uh, is consistent with the memo that we provided you was that had a lot of different items and attachments. Um, and so the staff recommended attachments, uh, the amendments were in attachment B, and we'll go through those. So as I said, just wanted to start off a little bit. Um, oh, and the other thing is after the, each of these sections, we're thinking we'll just stop and ask questions because they are sort of distinct and um, just so we can uh, respond to anything with each of the individual pieces. So just a little bit of additional background on um, the biological opinion, uh, just for clarity because it is complicated in addition to our own requirements. Um, so just a reminder, the area that we are working in, the Portland, or our com what we're calling combined flood hazard area. Um, it's basically these six waterways and their floodplains, uh, floodplains defined by both the FEMA 100-year floodplain uh, and the 1996, either uh, the existing 1996 uh, map or one that we, the additional model that we have uh, produced as a part of our project. So the overall purpose and goals of our of the project really, as we as we mentioned before, uh, maintaining access to floodplain insurance, and then also um, it allows us to be uh, 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 to, to utilize disaster relief funds uh, in the case of a disaster. Uh, in addition, reducing future flood risk for both people and buildings within the floodplain. For both those two first items, um, a, the a concern is definitely uh, for people of color and for the Johnson Creek area and also in the Columbia Slough or the Columbia Corridor more generally. Um, it's characterized by higher percentages of um, populations of people of color and also low income people. So uh, it's critical for those areas, especially. Um, expanding habitat for threatened and endangered species, that's the goal of the, uh, of the biological opinion. And then also, as we 
um, have discussed continuing our implementation of that citywide um, flood management, uh, floodplain management work plan that we that the bureau's directors have agreed to in 2019. So one of the things we wanted to clarify is just so the reasonable and prudent alternative is the, is sort of the collection of actions that the National Marine Fishery Service requests of FEMA, but then those requests of FEMA then in, in, in a number of cases, as you can see on the right of this table, are then tra are translated to requirements for City of Portland and, and changes that City of Portland will need to make. And so uh, just briefly uh, on this slide, there's these six elements that all make up the reasonable prudent alternative. First one is just notice that was really FEMA notifying the, the uh, National Flood Insurance Program communities about the biological opinion and, 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 the, and the action that's required. The interim measures, really, the, initially when the biop was uh, uh, released, there was an expectation that within the first two years there would be um, these immediate actions that FEMA would take uh, because Congress uh, gave them a three-year extension, gave FEMA a three-year extension. Those specific interim measures were never actually implemented, but they do have a lot of the key pieces, and we'll talk about that. Um, I just want to highlight a few of these that are relevant for us, but so those never went into effect. They really moved into um, element number four, which is the Long-Term Endangered Species Act compliance strategy that FEMA would uh, uh, develop and require of, of the uh, National Flood Insurance Program communities. Number three is just updating FEMA's mapping process, so making sure that they do have updated mapping, as we talked in the past. Um, you know, for example, our FEMA 100-year floodplain is definitely very out of date, and so uh, that's a piece that's relevant for us as well. And then uh, five and six are really about data collection from FEMA's perspective and then compliance, uh, uh, greater compliance moving forward. So as I said, for just want to highlight basically a few of these elements that are really relevant for us. In interim measures that were, was in, were in element two, this is where we get some of these minimum vegetation requirements, the uh, recommendation on the riparian buffer area, which is that area 170 feet from ordinary high water, um, mitigation of new impervious surfaces, and increased flood storage mitigation, as we talked about, which is uh, in the purview of the building code. So the floodplain resilience plan incorporates those vegetation requirements um, and the, uh, the riparian buffer area in the, on the Willamette River in the central reach already existing in the, in the south reach. Stormwater management manual, which is in the purview of the Bureau of Environmental Services is related to the impervious surface uh, mitigation. And then as we said, Title 24 in the flood storage. So again, this is the mapping of element three wasn't particularly specifically for NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program communities, but we recognize that the limitations, of, it recognized the limitations of the FEMA 100 year floodplain. And so our aim through the new modeled 1996 flood extent is to address some of that issue until FEMA adopts a, uh, a new FEMA 100 year floodplain, which as we've discussed, take a few years. And then as I said, Element number four is really the long-term strategy that FEMA will take to uh, ensure compliance with the uh, biological opinion. And so a key part of how they have uh, described that, uh, pr that approach that they will use is in the, uh, the uh, implementation plan that was released in October of 2021 and is now um, undergoing NEPA review. And we talked about that again in, I think, uh, the briefing maybe. Uh, lastly, just a little note. Data collection reporting, one thing that is a part of this is that uh, NFI, the National Flood Insurance Program uh, jurisdictions will need to document floodplain development moving forward and, re and provide that data uh, more consistently with, with uh, to, to FEMA. And that would be a Bureau of Development Services responsibility moving forward. So in your uh, memo that we sent, we had this timeline, just another question that came up in the um, and I guess maybe both the briefing and the hearing was about how all these pieces co come together and what is exactly the plan. Um, and this tries to capture uh, with the FEMA timeline at the top, um, all of the different pieces that we see this sort of multi-phased update that the city has embarked on and embarked on as basically as soon as it was released. 
So in the orange, you can see all of the zoning code updates, and that's why we're continuing or hoping to continue to make um, progress in these different areas and move continue to move forward from our from the regulation perspective. Um, in addition to those, so in the future, we as we have discussed, we have the economic opportunities analysis and the package that would go along with that, and then um, in the future, river plan, the North Reach. So looking at the North Reach of the Lamb River, and then some updates in Johnson Creek. And this is all aimed at getting to the um, expected compliance de uh, deadline, which is early of 2027. There's some dates marked up and marked off here that are scratch, um, scratched out at the top because it just represents that three-year um, adjustment that is a result of the um, delay from Congress. Uh, Bureau of Environmental Services continue to work, continues to work on mitigation, banking, and floodplain restoration efforts, and we can we'll talk a little bit about, uh, like I said, Caitlin, we'll talk a little bit about mitigation banking here in a sec. So, I will stop there before we move on to the next one and just open for questions. Jesse, I just want to clarify. Um, so, first of all, this map is super helpful. Thank you for creating that and sharing that. But it's only the things in orange that will be coming to the PSC and the Planning Commission in the future. Everything else stays in. Okay, gotcha. That's right. Commissioner, it's just a uh, Patricia Diefender for the record, just to point out that it part of the value of that is trying to show that even within the, the code and the regulatory piece, there's there's many pieces and all trying to be sequenced in such a way that we can meet that early 2027 deadline. Oh, I might just start out by saying, I mean, the way in which we communicate this is through these forums and, and you know, reinforcing with each piece that we do this, that this is part of a larger picture. So I want to thank you for challenging us to communicate that a little bit better. And I think with the, we've already been talking across teams with the um, economic opportunities analysis EOA work that's uh, that's being done that's in progress. There's we've been coordinating a lot on messaging to explain how these projects are interrelated and and will be considered together to inform the policy recommendations. So through the website, through our outreach, we're working diligently across teams to to try to message this in a way that's understandable to different folks. And at each interval that we bring something forward, I think it's really incumbent upon us to, to do a similar thing, which is to place this in that broader context. I hope that's helpful. Well, and I think the challenge is also not to overwhelm because we do have so many different things going on. And, and so another website or something, we do technically have a website that was originally developed early on that we don't have as like the central place for this, but maybe that's a consideration. So yeah, thanks for the recommendation. Thank you. Erica? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Thompson, for the question. So I think there's um, 
a number of different things. The, the ELA schedule, um, one of the things that's impacted the EOA schedule is just, frankly, staffing capacity. Um, at different times, we've had, you know, some challenges. COVID certainly presented a challenge. A lot of um, different priorities uh, kind of came up during COVID. And so, really, there's there's no, there's guidelines about, you know, timing for these uh, documents, but there isn't it a hard and fast deadline. Um, so, we are working on it now. Our goal is to um, complete that work by December of 2023. Interwoven in there, we do have to also do the housing needs analysis and the housing production strategy. There's a, and those do have some prescriptive timelines. So it's, it's a little bit about um, staffing capacity and uh, all of the different uh, demands, the different projects, some of which have state deadlines, some of which are the deadlines are more gu guidance, but certainly, you know, we want to keep our documents current. Um, so that's that's kind of there. There've also been some different parts of this of this project over time have um, have been appealed. They've they've had land use appeals, and we've had to go through those processes um, for different parts of the work. So those are all different factors for the the delays. And, and we're hopefully on track now to complete in the timeline that I have described. Uh, yeah, it's um, it, I don't think it's a document that requires um, council adoption so much as kind of it's a it's a policy document and a report, but the the goal is to um, have it completed by the end of 2023 and to give updates. Uh, I think we're likely to come to the PSC sometime in the late spring, perhaps. I, my computer just died and my schedule. I'm sorry, that's why I'm making faces over here. My computer just died in my schedule uh, that I was looking at is gone. But that is the you you should be we should be able to uh, give updates to the PSC and and kind of update on progress um, in the in the spring time frame. Patricia, would you like me to read the note there? Um, Tom sent us a note about this today. Tom Armstrong. Um, um, when we had a briefing early in 2022, we were, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, while we're waiting, um, other thoughts, questions? Oriana.
Oriana, thank you so much for raising that um, uh, and bringing that forward from the, the hearing. And I know in our last uh, work group for looking at like community involvement and engagement, um, that was was definitely we had a, a pr pretty um, significant conversation around and using talking about um, how different plans come to us and how how those filter through. And we were specifically um, connecting with uh, Nikoya Phillips and Harmony uh, from the community involved, like around uh, like how. How can this body, the Planning Commission going forward, um, better connect with the Community Involvement Committee um, and, and others uh, across bureaus as well to, to help make sure that, um, that these processes are um, accessible, knowable, uh, and, uh, and navigable? Is that, um, I don't know if I'm getting to, to everything. I think that's a big question. I appreciate you raising it. Um, was there any any other piece? Um, I know that those it's a it's a broad conversation. We've also had the conversation about like going forward on the dais. Like, do we? <laughs> how do we make this space uh, more welcoming um, and and less intimidating for people who um, this might be their first time? Uh, and we want to make sure that they feel honored and and appreciated in um, as they're sharing their lived experience and their perspective on things that matter to the entire city. Thank you. Sally. Yes, thank you. Um, I found the note in this long email. Um, uh, we expect to get to city council with the EOA in 2024. And that's all the detail I have. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, this is Patricia Defender for again. I think the timelines for the housing needs assessment and the economic opportunities analysis um, Essentially, because there is specific timelines from the state for the housing needs analysis, at, we're at a juncture where the timelines, the demands of that project are also affecting the um, economic opportunities analysis. So the, the goal is to keep them both moving forward. They're both built upon a foundational um, uh, platform, which is the buildable land inventory which is something that, that the staff is working on currently. So they really do build upon each other. But um, I think just another point of note about the, the outreach on this, on this project and the economic opportunities analysis and the interrelationship, that is, I think there's a couple of things we heard at the hearing, right, the hearing on this project. One was just a general, there was concern about the holding or separating the Title 24 uh, zoning code or building code changes because that is an important piece of it. And people, I think some some um, stakeholders felt like that was a, a significant delay for something that's important to the overall goals of this project. I think you're going to hear later um, about a, a timeline that we have now for that project. Um, also, we've been working again across the teams to, to talk about how we message around the, the two projects and their relationship and also how we engage stakeholders who, um, you know, there's a convergence of obviously the, the kind of environmental issues along with the industry and jobs conversation around the river and we're really trying to be thoughtful about how we engage the wide range of stakeholders on on those topics as we go forward with the EOA, which is one of the reasons why that the floodplain work, um, you know, the Columbia corridor is exempted because we want to really have a meaningful conversation, including all those different parties and interests um, on those on that project. Thank you, Patricia. Gabe.
Thank you. And and I hope we'll get into that <laughs> as we go forward. Um, other thoughts? And I just want to note a, a meta um, point that uh, I think we've I sometimes toggle between referring to people as commissioner and, and first name um, and often use first name because we use first name for staff. Um, but uh, I'd be delighted, especially as we're talking about work groups, about welcoming and community involvement and, and processes if people have thoughts on that point. Wait, please, I'll re return it to staff. Okay, so um, somewhat to Commissioner Shuship's comment, we just wanted to talk specifically about what um, is proposed in the plan, just for clarity. Um, so some of the potential effects of our plan. Um, we first wanted to start we to revisit this breakdown. This was requested earlier, and we had included this, I think, in the hearing presentation. Sort of breaks down where the updates, you know, basically looking at um, two zoning zoning designations that are being changed: um, the River Environmental, which is applied in the Willamette River, and the Environmental Con uh, Environmental Overlay Zone, both Environmental uh, Conservation and Protection. And so, as you can see, we just highlighted the large majority of the of the area that where these changes would take effect would be in open space. But then there are um, about 14% of of those of the areas in single dwelling residential zones um, that are actually these are connected to the, where they are in the pla have the uh, floodplain on them. And then also f the combination of the multi dwelling residential and commercial mixed use um, is a roughly around 11%. So those are the three primary primary areas. Um, the others are relatively small, including some uh, a small amount of employment lands that are outside of those three zones that we have um, not applied the changes to at this point uh, for the Columbia Corridor. And then, yeah, just some campus institutional in Multnomah County. Um, so we wanted to provide just some typical situations to again it seemed like in our discussions people were having a little and i understand having a hard time following what all these mean and what it means on the ground so um this first example is looking at what as i said the river environmental overlay zone and as a part of that really the main update for us in this project is the um, addition of the riparian buffer area into the central city it's already in place in the south reach so in this sort of Hypothetical example, we're just looking at a central city site. There's an existing warehouse on the site. Um, the existing uh, building has a small a small portion of it's on the in the floodplain, but not much. The, there is an existing 50-foot setback that was adopted as part of the central city 2035 plan. And this graphic also shows that riparian buffer area. So the, it's 170 feet. Um, as long as the floodplain extends to 170 feet. So if, a, if the floodplain as we define it, which is both, as we said, the FEMA 100-year floodplain or the, the 1996 maps, um, if it's less than 170 feet, it does not apply there. It, it stops at the boundary. So just in this kind of our hypothetical here, we're proposing a multi-dwelling building, which is more common, uh, most common in the central, central reach. Um, in this case, a portion of the development would be within the floodplain and um, a relatively small portion in this case is in the riparian buffer area. Um, development outside the riparian buffer area would, would be, be required to meet the river environmental overlay zone if it, if it was applied. Um, and that's just you know our standard mitigation of impacts to natural resources. Um, in the riparian buffer area, the proposal in addition to just meeting the base Right, river environmental requirements, which is a kind of a one-to-one -one mitigation. <clears throat> the area here shown, you would have to uh, offset the impacts to the riparian buffer area, and through that, that is the improvements to um, the floodplain kind of related natural uh, uh, resource rip riparian functions that we define in our natural resources inventory. And so, to do that, improve those improvements, there might be something like removal of the of concrete or riprap or other impervious surface from the uh, riverbank um, and returning it to a more, more natural character, uh, laying back the bank, so actually having shallow water habitat where 
um, you know, for juvenile fish, um, or additionally, you know, placing large wood, which would be anchored in the riverbank. And so in this case, you know, we just have this hypothetical where there is the, the riprap that's on the bank. And so um, you might, that's where the area of additional improvement that we would want to see. And all of this would be negotiated or be discussed with um, the Bureau of Development Services through a land use review, similar to what we do in a lot of cases for environmental impacts. The other area that we're talking about, which really applies to everywhere else in the city, um, is the environmental overlay zones. Uh, and so in this case, uh, as, as uh, Commissioner Shuships mentioned, really we're focused on just vegetation, on vegetation management in the, in the, in the flood hazard area. So this example, you know, a single dwelling home with a driveway and a garden that does extend into the environmental conservation overlay zone. Um, let's just say someone, the uh, homeowners wanted to build a, uh, a new shed and you know, sure, it, the, just for the, for in theory, it's just to, to represent where you might, what, just the example of required tree replacement, because you know, you could put that elsewhere and not require tree, tree removal. But this is just an example to show that basically what we're doing, what we're updating is that um, number one, um, the tree, tree number three is a non-native, non-invasive tree. And currently those are exempted from the, from the environmental overlay zone requirements. We would be treating them similar to how we treat native uh, trees, which is, was shown in number one and two here on the diagram. Uh, tree number one would not be affected by our proposal because it is outside the floodplain. Um, and in this case, out, outside the river environmental. So that would be uh, just need to meet the tree code, cut 011. And so what we're doing for those two trees that are, and we're handling them the same as, whereas right now they're handled differently in the, in the environmental overlay zone, would basically, they would both be required if you were to remove them, to replace them with three trees, as com a minimum of three trees. And we go up from there, depending on the size of the tree within the existing code. It already goes up to, up to greater than three replacement, depending on how large a tree is. But what we're doing is setting a baseline for what would need to be done. So you would need to um, replace it with three, or you could pay into the revegetation fund if, if that is an option. Um, and so in total, roughly what we're saying here is in this case, if you include the Title 11 requirements, you just, for those three trees, a minimum of seven trees would likely need to be planted, would need to be planted. So that was it, just trying to, again, bring it to re, sort of real life-ish examples. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to ask, answer those as well. And I will stop sharing so that we can see people. Thoughts? Jesse. I think I've asked this a few times, but still it's something that kind of confuses me a little bit um so in terms of mitigation banking or something of that sort if you are doing some type of environmental degradation it's like a one-to-one -one type mitigation banking situation like you destroy this much you have to mitigate for this much in the future is that kind of what you're talking about with this plan um, we aren't really changing that in this plan. The river environmental we already have, so we handle things a little differently because we assume that right now in the environmental overlay zone, it wouldn't, there's no banks to use for habitat at the moment. Um, the river environmental is sort of structured to in preparation for the opportunity for banks, and there are some existing banks that support the Superfund site as we've discussed. In that case, what we have said, and one of the things that we do a little differently in the river environmental is actually it's not a technically a one to one. It is a one to one in the long term. But what we say is actually the mitigation area actually is one and a half times what the impact is. But one thing that we do in the way we structure the mitigation requirements is on site and mitigation banks are viewed the same because we have more certainty. We feel like we have more certainty in that, whereas an off site owned or controlled by that's still under the per, the applicant would be man, responsible for ensuring that mitigation continues and is successful the ratio is higher i think it's two to one for that um, and so we have that tiering of where we have a little bit more certainty on um, ensuring that mitigation survives and, and is successful 
Okay. That's really, really helpful. And um, this again might be more on the environmental services side, but I'm just curious if like the principle of it's a lot easier to just destroy really um, ecologically positive like habitats than it is to create new ones, even if it is in mitigation, like planting one tree versus having ones that have been there for a long time and like have helped build up a habitat there. Is that principle embodied in a lot of the work we do? Is that thought about yeah, I mean, I, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, yeah, the point, the the reason for that difference instead of just being one to one is that it takes a long time, especially again as Mr. as Commissioner Shuship said, you if you an, a mature tree, potentially a very large tree, those trees that you plant take there's a sort of a time part component of it that they won't be there for a long time, so that's why we require a greater mitigation to account for that duration. And then just assuming, obviously, it's more than just trees, the mitigation of like destroying like wetland habitats and then trying to do that elsewhere. That's right. I'm just covering all my bases, making sure yeah, that's yeah. still in there. And all of that okay. is handled the same. And yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. Commissioner Magnera? If I could jump in, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, good evening. My name is Caitlin Lovell. I am a, a regulatory manager with the Bureau of Environmental Services here at the city, and I've been working on the mitigation banking component of this project. Um, I'm also responsible for the Endangered Species Act compliance for the city of Portland. So, uh, what salmon and steelhead need within the city is very near and dear to my. Uh, everyday world. And so this is a great question and it's one that we're all wrestling with. And part of it is the limits of our knowledge of what the habitats, how the fish are using the habitat. So we're doing a lot of excellent data gathering um, and monitoring of the species in the city. And we certainly work closely with both Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and National Marine Fisheries Service who also have uh, corresponding jurisdiction over these species. So a lot of it is um, putting the professional and the technical heads together and ensuring that, um, especially in areas on the Willamette, a lot of the habitat that we are really focused on is considered shallow water habitat. So habitat that is uh, shallower than 20 feet deep from ordinary, um, it, we typically measure it from ordinary high water, but it's really water surface elevation. And just simply the, the depth there and the shallow water habitat is not nearly enough. We need to really understand what's the cobble size, the depth of the cobble size for other species like lamprey that are breeding and actually burrow in that sediment, the relationship with the riparian area and the trees, making sure that there's good willows and alders there. So it's not just rearing habitat, but there's actually a food source to provide um, while they're hanging out under those overhangs and snags. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that the way that we are calculating this within the Title 33 code, it's a functions and values assessment, but within the state and the federal system, they have different calculations. And so we're really doing a, uh, a crosswalk uh, uh, across the different ways we calculate these things to make sure that we're consistent. And there is a tool that we use in the Willamette that the federal and the state government use that we're trying to um, crosswalk to our functions and values approach that does capture exactly those kinds of things. So we score habitat, not just based on the depth, but by the proximity to trees, um, if there's spawning gravels there. And it really does come down to the species that we're also talking about. And so those get added up. So um, Chinook will use habitat in one way, lamprey will use it in another, coho will use it in a third way, bull trout in another. Um, and then we start getting up upland. And so then we start talking about frogs and river otter and beaver, and those all layer on into the functions and values. And those are all captured so that we're also um, 
really trying to better understand the interactions of the different habitats together and that codependency of the habitat. So it's not just enough for us to protect the salmon, but we need to be protecting the beaver and the otter and um, the herons and the, the eagles that are also eating and feeding on those same species. So that is part of all of the mitigation banking conversation. It's a long-winded answer, a uh, great question. Thank you. Um, and related, thank you, Commissioner Joseph. If you were not raising your hand, I would beg to call on you. Thank you. Thank you. Thoughts? Okay. All right. That's a great conversation. Thank you so much. I've learned a lot. I guess I should turn that on. Um, okay. So the next thing that we were thinking of providing just a quick summary of the public testimony that we received. Um, we had a total of 53 uh, different sort of submitted testimony, 46 written, five oral, as you all know, I mean, most of you know who are here, and two that submitted both. Um, just highlights of some of the messages that were in those uh, in that testimony, you know, climate change response is critical and really asking to, to, to move forward quickly. Um, as we've discussed, uh, specifically uh, related to things like Title 24 and other considerations that we, you know, the request that all of what was in the discussion draft continue to move forward as one package. Um, as we've already discussed tonight, expedite work in the industrial areas and the EOA. Um, and then there were a few um, 
uh, bits of testimony related to slowing down the project. So until we know more about uh, really from FEMA and uh, specifically, I think some of the concerns are about the Title 24 changes in, in that case. That's all I have for the public testimony summary. I don't know if there's really any questions that would come out of that. We can continue to move forward if, unless there's things that... Uh... Actually, I feel I should know this. Um, what, just in, in case, because this is a complicated project, we're all coming at it from different places. And I mean, I know that I'm learning in real time um, in terms of, I know at the end of this, we're looking to... Um, to continue this to November 22nd with the hope of a, of a recommendation between, um, just like if there is, I'm not saying there is, but if there is a need for delay, um, in our proceedings, um, I'm just, I'm just trying to think of what, you know, what are some of the downside impacts of that? Does that make sense? I'm hearing a lot of questions that that seem still new, and there's and there was a lot of meaty testimony. Um, we also and and I really appreciate staff for um, uh, creating not one but two opportunities for biop um, legal briefings so that we can understand that aspect. There's just there, this is a pretty dynamic um, project, and I'm just trying to understand what are our pathways for meaningful conversations if they have to go beyond November 22nd? That's a terrible question to ask. I'm sorry. Thank you. Commissioners, um, I, th I think our approach is always that we're, we're going to work with you and try to um, bring information, answer your questions, and um, allow the time that's needed to do that. Um, I think what we heard was, you know, uh, a, a number of, of testimony and um, individuals speaking to the need to move the project forward. So just wanting to balance kind of making sure that there's been a lot of effort and engagement um, and uh, time spent on the project and just wanting to make sure that, um, you know, we move this piece forward so that we can focus on the other pieces, you saw the diagram with all of the different components that have to happen. So um, just, you know, any any delay would just mean that we would, um, it would be that much, you know, farther out for adoption. We are targeting a spring, um, mid to late spring um, council for this item. So we have a little bit of time. We can work through various um, questions with you. And we just really want to understand, um, you know, what the questions and concerns are and try to address them. Thank you. Commissioner Spivak. Great question to keep in mind. Thank you. And yeah, I mean, I mentioned that we have some recommended amendments. So we assume that between now and um, our next session, we would work through any of that uh, that the commission has. We have not heard of anything specifically requested of us for amendments. So we will continue on then. Um, so another thing that came up uh, in the hearing was related to the uh, removal. And again, I neglected to include that in the list of things that have changed since the discussion draft, but we had removed the, uh, in the discussion draft, we had um, expansions for the environmental conservation overlay zone um, outside of the three cr critical kind of EOA zones, which is the uh, heavy industrial uh, uh, general Employment 2 and um, General Industrial 2. So IG2, EG2, IH. Beyond that, we had some expansions that were proposed. Um, 
one of the things that we had in the discussion draft was that it was both uh, developed and undeveloped floodplain since then through conversations with BDS and as a, specifically about the central east side and other areas, we had decided we were going to remove the developed floodplain just because we weren't going to be able to get improvement with those um, environmental overlay zones. Um, but with that removal, there were 77 acres that were included in that expansion that would have been included in the expansion and we would carry it forward. Since then, the Columbia Corridor Industrial Lands E-Zone project, which is a partner pr project that is going along with the EOA, has started. And as a part of that um, that project, it's early on and asking, we're really doing, they're doing site visits on that to confirm the presence of natural resources in the, in the corridor. But that is taking the same approach, more or less, at least to the starting point, um, to identify uh, to, as we did in the use on map correction project that will then be kind of in the whole s scheme of things in terms of eoa and the different constraints um, that kind of update it's really the key part of that is to um, recognize using new technologies where those identifying where those resources are and then evaluating the potential for protections on them so one of the key reasons why we decided to pull back on the expansions of the conserv environmental conservation overlay zone for the non natural lands is just that there is a high potential for some of those to become environmental protection. And so we didn't want to have sort of multiple processes and changes on properties, you know, within a year or two where we're basically saying, oh, you're an environmental conservation overlay zone. Now you're an environmental protection, which is a much more strict um, overlay zone. And so as you can see here, roughly around 60 percent, we we estimate just looking at our current. And again, there's going to be some all of these are under, under consideration and um, will be part of the overall EOA conversation. But there's a large almost 70 percent of those lands could potentially then be we turn around and turn them into environmental protection overlay zone. So um, to try to keep that as simple as possible for people and have one process, that was the aim, is we have both. We will address those three industrial zones and um, these other zones in the corridor as well. A secondary benefit of this is that there, the actual natural resources plans in that in the corridor are multi, they're varied. There's like four different plans and it's kind of complicated. And so part of the project that is part of the EOA package will be a kind of cleaning up of that underlying natural resources inventory data um, so that then it's much easier for implementation for Bureau of Development Services. So that was also a relatively short item. If there's any questions. And her shoe ships. Uh, we have one. We can provide it to you if you'd like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can create one for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not. I don't know. It's not. Okay. So that'll be in a, a follow up. Yeah. Removed. Happy to provide it. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Speedback. I mean, I think we'd have to look at the specifics. Um, I'm not sure if I could say that it's not developable. I think we'd have to get into the details of it, but there, but basically the area that we would be expanding, in fact, I mean, whether that's more justification or less, uh, we'd have to look at the specific sites and determine where they all are um, and what currently is allowed and all of those things. Um, but 
and whether I, I think what it says is that a lot of those areas do not currently have environmental overlays on. So we would, if we were to apply it, it would be a conservation overlay zone, which would generally allow development, but we, it would, again, it would depend on the site. And then the environmental protection is, is going to be much more strict in terms of what would be allowed. He doesn't think it's worth it. That's what that was here. Yeah. Really? It's not. Yeah. And we can, yeah, we can uh, talk more specifically. But yeah, the open space, we won't see any development in the open space. Um, the only, um, yeah, the, I guess what I would say is that you're correct that maybe the largest consideration would be in the R10, where that is, um, it's a large number of uh tax lots, as you can see there, so 56 tax lots. So what, in terms of individual properties, how much is really there is, a you know, if to be developed um, through, there's a lot of properties. So you'd have to have a lot of properties to get to that 9.8 um, acres, you know, developed. But um, a portion, a good portion of that War, at least in our initial assessment of the corridor, us warrants and environmental protection, which are, are closer, generally closer to waterways and, and other wetlands and things. Thank you. Commissioner Shusips and then Commissioner Manyara. Yeah, that was something that was specifically in the biological opinion. The basis of it is looking at research, past research in terms of, you know, it's the typical size of a mature tree in along river, in riparian areas along Oregon. Um, and so it was a specific recommendation for um, from the National Marine Fisheries Service in terms of the area of additional protection, which was really trying in that area, um, really specifically focused on river dependent, river related development, if, if that's appropriate, and um, ensuring that other things that are allowed in that area are low impact. Commissioner Manyara, No, I think I understand. Um, so I think what I would say is that the only time that something would trigger a NEPA review is a federal action. And so it would depend on, I mean, I think it's really federal ownership. And I guess I might just defer to Caitlin in terms of these considerations. But um, only particular types of development would trigger a NEPA review. It's really that is a federal process. Um, and so... You might have other permits, um, so Section 404 permits, or other federal permits that would require mitigation for impacts and things like that, um, that are or state requirements potentially with it from like Department of State land, state lands and things like depending on what the character is of the waterway. Um, but something NEPA is very unique in terms of it. It really has to be. It's a kind of a federal action that needs to be reviewed through that process. Commissioners Patricia Diefender for. I I'm looking to others to correct me, if, but I, I do believe that just 
typical development in the city does not go through a NEPA review. And I think it's projects that are have federal involve federal land or federal funding, if I'm if I'm um, stating that correctly. So your typical project, um, and when we referred to NEPA in this process, like in that timeline, that was the, the NEPA review and clearance for this work <laughs> that the that is being done at the federal level, the the changes that that the FEMA would be doing to comply with the biop. Because really they're the ones who are supposed to comply, but because, you know, they they've some of those things as they relate to land use, it gets kind of pushed down to the local level. And feel free to correct me if I said anything wrong there. No, that's accurate. It's a federal nexus. So it's uh, federal permits, federal funding, federal policy development, and federal lands that trigger NEPA. And uh, Ms. Stiefendorfer is correct that the FEMA policies are the process are going through a, what's called a programmatic NEPA assessment, but that wouldn't necessarily affect the timelines here. And um, w the, the level of detail that we are providing here would actually uh, help to support the federal NEPA assessment that's happening. But I will say where that may create some um, confusion as we're talking about public engagement and public process is the NEPA process at the federal level has been uh, on these FEMA changes in particular in other states has been a point of litigation. And so that can dry, drag out the process a lot more. Um, but typically what happens in that case is that they're required to do an even deeper analysis to go back and kind of redo their analysis before they adopt the final project. So as long as we're continuing to move forward here, uh, the NEPA process shouldn't slow any of that down. This is a, a question I also had when we talked about it in like the biop briefing. And my main question was, isn't it a federal action to give like FEMA backed insurance? Like that's the process. So these developers would have to have FEMA backed insurance, which is like going through that roundabout way. So this would be essentially under NEPA because FEMA would be taking an action there. So those developers... Like, I know that's really convoluted, but this is a convoluted thing, so. The NEPA analysis that's going on right now is programmatic, so it would cover all of those actions. It's basically any insurance that's issued through this program will have gone through NEPA review. So it's not an individual insurance claim by insurance claim. Um, trying to think, Jason, I don't know if on the CLOMARS and LOMARS, that also does not go through a NEPA analysis that's considered part of this umbrella process. I just want to make sure I'm stating that correctly. Yeah, Sorry, the little... letters of map revision on the floodplain. Thank you. Yeah. So there's a conditional yeah. and a letter of map revision. So CLOMAR and LOMAR, conditional. So when a developer does build in the floodplain and they um, want to change the maps on their property, they have to make a specific application to FEMA to change the maps in order to get mapped out of the floodplain and get mapped out of having to pay flood insurance. And that itself is a federal action. But I believe that's why I'm looking to Jason, our counterpart at Bureau of Development Services, to make sure that that process uh, does not have an independent NEPA pathway. Well, Jason, I think you can keep your mic off because uh, so the, the next thing that we were going to so we're ready to go. Uh, the next thing we were going to address was related to the uh, building code updates. And let me get you set up, Jason. And I think Commissioners Patricia Diefendorfer, just as, as we um, get ready to hear from uh, Jason on the Title 24 and Caitlin on the mitigation bank, just be reminded that these are not part of the action before you, but this is um, staff responding to your questions and wanting to understand all the different components that are that are accompanying, you know, or that are part of this larger action plan that the city is working on. But these are not items that are that are part of this package or before the commission currently.
Jason, sorry to interrupt you. I apologies. I just the PowerPoint hadn't loaded yet, but it's there now. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, Jason, just let me jump in really quickly. So the high, just to make clear what the high hazard area is. So it's basically the um, furthest landward of the floodway, which is the sort of defined channel, more or less. And Jason can straighten me out on anything, but that in and the combination of the floodway, which is a main channel, and the ten-year flood interval. So the higher, um, more likely to be flooded areas, very generally near. The waterway so that's we already have limits on what can be done in the floodway um, but that is where this higher very high ratio two to one would be applied and then also i just wanted to also for the title three map just to be clear currently the title three map includes the fema 100 year floodplain and the 1996 flood inundation area which was is based on a aerial photo of the uh, from the morning after the february 1996 flood so that that is required as from uh, as a part of uh, our compliance with Metro Title Three, Sorry, Jason.
Nancy? So if I'm understanding correctly, um, especially based on the, the preponderance of testimony we received that, that the 24, Title 24 um, package and, and Title 33, um, this floodplain resilience would go before council at the same time. <laughs> Commissioner Patricia Defender for yes. Um, just wanted to emphasize that that the goal, what we're uh, communicating here, is that there's a timeline sort of mapped out that would allow these to meet back up. They won't necessarily go at exactly the same time, but that they'll meet um, and go to council around this, that projected sort of April May time frame. Um, that was something that we really worked closely with our BDS partners on because of the, the concerns and the preponderance, as you said, of testimony around concerns that they be they might be more significantly delayed. And so we're really we we thank our partners at BDS for kind of um, you know coming together and outlining a process that will allow it to catch up. Thank you, Commissioner Thompson.
Well, thank you, Jesse. I'm sorry, Commissioner Gittemeyer. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Thompson. I definitely agree with everything you just said. And I think what we've heard from the public, it's kind of hard to like separate these two things. Um, and I guess now sitting here and thinking about it, so Title 24 does all of the, the mitigation banking and all of the concerns for environmental degradation in a cut and fill sense. What does the current Title 33 then look at? Are we just looking at trees and like the removal of trees? Or what is the, do you know what I'm saying? Uh, I wouldn't characterize that the, I mean, for the flood storage mitigation, we have recognized that it's more important for, have to have mitigation banks because especially of these higher ratios. Mitigation banks are relevant for both Title 33 changes, if they were, if mitigation banks are available to offset the impacts, and Title 24 changes. Uh, the Title 33 proposals are really focused, and the, and the requirements are really focused on ensuring floodplain habitat. Um, Title 24, and that's why we have them separate, is that Title 24 and the building code is really about ensuring conveyance of floods, as we showed at that diagram, after development happens. And so one of the parts that is, um, you know, interesting about the biological opinion is it's sort of combining those two related to the flood storage capacity. What are our obligations related to habitat in a excav excavation, a commensurate excavation? But these two pieces are handling different things. The main thing, the main purpose of the requirements in the um, in, in Title 24 are about conveyance. And then that is the reason why it's in Title 24, other than that there's an engineering component to it, is it's also partnered with flood proofing of buildings and things like that. It's a building code. It does, it, it's like how you design your building in addition to ensuring with development that you maintain that flood storage capacity. And so for our immediate like issues of these changes, the mitigation banking for the Title 24 changes are, are more um, of a of an issue to be addressed, especially, for example, when we have places in the central city where we expect that we are going to have higher development and development that's, you know, the zoning code allows development f from lot line to lot line, and we're really looking for higher density development, mitigation banks are more important for that at this, at, at this juncture. That makes sense. I guess my question is, isn't there going to be equally, if not more, environmental concern in the cut and fill process of like adding more soil or land to existing wetlands? And isn't that like what we were getting comment about? Or am I misunderstanding that? The, Patricia Diefendorfer and Jeff and others, feel free to correct me. But I think the, the Title 24 changes are about changing those ratios in such a way that new development does not um, add more displacement of water, right? And so in this intervening time, um, it, I mean, it, you know, whatever development happens, they're still subject to cut and fill. Um, they would be subject to more. That's, that's the reason why I think uh, many uh, of the, t the test, much of the testimony is really demonstrating how important that is. Um, as long as there isn't a significant delay in these two parts, um, I don't think we're going to see like development in the in the near term in these next you know six, four to six months, whatever it is, that are going to really materially. Um, it, there's not going to be a material impact. I, I think the real thing is just the the real issue is just trying to get it in place sooner than later, and to have the mitigation banks in place to help people offset to the extent that that is needed. Because there's also, I mean, I think what we're what we're kind of haven't really talked about too much is just the um, the balancing of a lot of different needs. Right? We have properties, and, and that's why I asked staff to show. Uh, the the table that shows the the underlying zoning how how much land we're talking about relatively speaking in terms of underlying zoning in the downtown obviously we have um, higher density uh, zoning we expect to see housing right and and we have a housing shortage we need to make sure we can build housing but at the same time 
we're trying to make sure that it's it's done um, in, a, in an environmentally sensitive manner, addressing all of these different concerns. So the mitigation bank allows us to be able to continue to have the development happen where it's you know it's appropriate and where it's it's zoned to to do that for other meeting other goals that the city has, but giving people options for how they can offset impacts um, as it relates to the floodplain, flood storage, and um, species, you know, species habitat. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, do you want to ask your question again in another way? Did I miss some part of it as I was waxing poetic about this? No, I think what you're saying makes sense. And maybe I'm misunderstanding it, but I just see the Title 24 changes that are being proposed in the cut and fill like are going to have strong environmental considerations. And I think what we were getting in the public testimony was that people are very concerned about that and would like to talk about that and they don't really have an avenue for doing that. And so I guess my question in all of this is, if that's the biggest like environmental aspect of talking about like the mitigation banks needed for that, which not necessarily mitigation banks, but like if you're actually filling that space, like what are the environmental impacts of that? Talking about when we're talking about Title 33 and the environmental impacts here. So maybe I could try to clarify. So the Title 24, I think what you're saying is, was there concern that the Title 24 changes themselves would have environmental impacts? And I, is that what you're asking? Yeah, I think a public comment generally was, yeah, talking about that there are environmental issues. With I have to confess, is that what we heard? Because I think what we heard was a real keen desire to have those in place because without them, there would be impacts. Okay, so I just want to be very clear about that. Title 33, and I'm going to oversimplify this and and. <laughs> Jeff, correct me if I'm really wrong, but essentially Title 33 is more about dealing with the health of the, the bank and the vegetation and not disrupting the bank too much and making sure that we put back vegetation, you know, we don't take out vegetation or we put back vegetation in the course of doing development. The Title 24 is about this, you know, if you take, if you put dirt in the ground and more building, if you have subterranean structure, for example, you're going to displace the, um, the ability for water to, to, be, to move through there. And that's going to push the water in that diagram that we saw will push the water to other locations and create flood risk for other locations. So the, I think the, the real thing that I heard from the testimony, honestly, is the recognition that these are all parts of a whole and that they, they need to you know, ideally come together and come together as quickly as possible. That being said, I think what we've tried to demonstrate to the commission and the public who are um, interested in this subject is that there's a, there's a lot of moving parts. It's the city, you know, our processes are such that we try to break things down into manageable pieces so that we can actually make progress on the manageable pieces. And what you're seeing here is really that. Um, did I, is, is there anything else we can add to that? Yeah, I guess I was just going to make one small point and we were going to go to mitigation banking, uh, too, but it seems like Eli has a question, but, um, I think what your concern is title 33 takes care of what I'm hearing as you're saying, you're, um, thinking that without changes to title 24, that the placement of fill will have environmental damage, well, that will create environmental damage. That's the role of title 33. So those impacts, so even currently, if they have to meet Title 24 and do the balance cut fill, if they're going to fill and it's, in, if it's in an environmental zone, they need to mitigate the impacts on any natural resources are there. So that is the role, though that's how they're split. Primarily, the, the, again, the Title 24 is about, okay, if you're going to place the fill there, okay, Title 33 lays out how you're going to offset that, what you're going to do to mitigate that either on-site or off-site. If you put the fill in, you then go also go to Bureau of Development Services and they say, okay, you have this volume that you're filling. Well, now that requires you to, to excavate a certain, the same amount somewhere, and sometimes that can be off-site or on-site, but that's a very engineering-focused in terms of that conveyance. But the habitat, the natural resources that are there are really fo the focus of Title 33, and that's why we're trying to make sure that the uh, develop, undeveloped floodplain especially is in the, in the environmental overlay zones. 
Okay, yeah, that was definitely my question, and that answers my question. So thank you very much. Sorry for the confusion. No, no worries. Patricia Defend refer. If I could just add one more thing, which and and Jeff, feel free to correct me. I think when you refer to Title Thirty Three as as having the requirements of what the the mitigation is, that's when we're talking about is the E zones, right? The t- the different flavors of E zone. Is that correct? And, that's, That's right. where the requirements come from to begin with, as far as right. So the environmental overlay zone, the river overlay, river environment, and river environmental. So really, those are the two. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the zoning code. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Title Thirty Three. Thank you, Commissioner Spivak. Other thoughts before we go on? And recognizing that it is, we're getting long in the tooth for this evening. We were so happy to be ahead of schedule. Um, So yes, now we can uh, go, really we wanted to talk about mitigation banks and I had had accidentally stopped my PowerPoint. So we will go to, and again, this is more just sort of background information on some of the efforts we've been working on with mitigation banks and so Caitlin. Uh, good evening again. My name is Caitlin Lovell with the Bureau of Environmental Services and uh, I've been working with this team. I feel like we've been working side by side for six years uh, that after this project's done, we're gonna go form a comedy troupe. Um, and my role has been on the, the mitigation banking and the um, Okay. the role that environmental services plays on the impervious area and on the restoration component. Um, I really appreciate the struggle that I've heard in this question of have, where where's the environmental pieces and where are the flood pieces. And one of the ways um, that I've been able to wrap my head about around it is in Title 24, we're really looking at it from, from an insurance perspective. So if you are an insurance uh, person, you're really interested in the risks created to people and property and protecting against that. What the FEMA buyout, but the biological opinion really forced us to do is say, okay, when that water comes up and floods the riverbanks and there's a building in the way, we now need you to take the perspective of the fish. What's happening to them? Where are they going? And that is really where the role of Title 33 comes in. So these two work really well together. Title 24, though, what we need to do is make sure that when that <clears throat> flood happens, um, that how we mitigate for that flood storage capacity doesn't further damage the fish that are using that habitat. So um, we can't really put in all of the environmental components into Title 24 that uh, the biological opinion might wish we could. But what we can do is put in components that say, okay, if you're gonna you know, do a balance cut and fill on site, you have to make sure that that cut drains to the river, that the fish aren't gonna get stranded there, that they're not going to be creating a water quality hazard, right? It's not gonna be a stormwater facility that you count as a cut where you might actually have polluted water. So we're, we're really kind of considering that in Title 24. The role of mitigation banks in this and all of this is just an additional tool for us to help um, solve some of these problems that are going to be created on site when these uh, these requirements increase. So we currently have code that requires mitigation on site for both environmental and cut fill. Um, the environmental pieces are really important. The mitigation you know, you have to go through a hierarchy first where you avoid and then you minimize the impacts and then you get to mitigation. And right now mitigation is either on site or it is off site at a um, place that you own or have legal control over. So those options have been working okay up to this point. I think a great example of it uh, on the Willamette is the, um, if you're out on the river right now or down in South Waterfront, the Alamo Manhattan, the work that they're doing on the riverbank, the right there is something that we work really closely with BDS and the developer and and coming to an agreement on as mitigation on site. However, um, 
and when and when there's a cut required, that happens now typically on site uh, in Johnson Creek. It has to be on site in the Willamette River. It can happen um, elsewhere in the river system because of the way the floodwaters work. But we're really not thinking about how those cuts impact fish. So what the mitigation banking that we're talking about now is um, really trying to bring those two pieces together, but not necessarily on the, the footprint of the development, but somewhere else. <clears throat> and so um, the concept of this is that we go out and we restore a site. We um, actually improve ecological function so that when developers come in and impact it, they already have a site that's working and they simply go to that site developer and write a check basically for how much is uh, what their impact is and then what the price of the offset is. And typically this happens in individual resource um, sectors like wetlands, for example, or trees. What we're trying to do is start to build a more holistic package of that. The floodplain, um, sorry, the flood storage component is going to be potentially an interim bridge. Ideally, we want to have those together at the same site. Um, but because mitigation banking takes so long to actually, the lead time to find sites and develop them and build them and fund them, um, what we're really looking for is a couple of sites currently exist in the Willamette River that are affiliated with Portland Harbor. So we can't actually um, use them as Title 33 banks. We can only use them as Portland Harbor banks, but they do have flood storage capacity that's unaccounted for. And so we're working with the Portland Harbor trustees right now to identify those sites specifically for those Title 24 requirements, but they would be on sites that have the habitat, right? So we're not getting, we're not able to sell the credits for the habitat, but we are co-locating that flood storage with the habitat. So I think that helps we're not building it specifically into the Title 24 code, but as we implement this, we can really start to address this issue. Um, mitigation banking is different from in lieu fees, and I think this is a really critical part of um, how people talk about this. An in lieu fee is where a developer writes a check um, to a local government or to whoever is a regulating agency with a promise to mitigate later. And so as we're talking about cutting down big trees and replacing it with smaller trees, if we're talking about um, filling wetlands that take years to regrow in a different site, that temporal delay causes additional harms. And so the in lieu fees really don't account for that. Um, they And and a lot of times they create an uncertainty of when that project's going to go forward and how it's actually going to um, perform. So the mitigation banking is a much higher certainty approach. We we know the project's in the ground. It's already been built. We know what the cost is, and it has to be successful in order for us to be able to sell credits. Uh, the in-lieu fees do work in some very limited situations, so it's not to say that those wouldn't be part of this conversation, but I just want to um, be clear that they have a different, um, they, it's a different approach that generally doesn't work uh, or doesn't receive approval from the state and the federal agencies. Next slide. <clears throat> so what we've done here in Portland is because I've mentioned there aren't mitigation banks here in the city, um, the ones that we do have are privately owned banks specifically for Portland Harbor. As we've been making these code changes, um, we have been building in the ability to develop mitigation banks just so that we don't have to go back and redo the code later. Um, and then what what I've been working on um, with folks from BPS and BDS as well as now the commissioner's office is really understanding how do we create uh, both a pilot project here in Portland and then a bigger system of mitigation banks. And that required a lot of due diligence up front. So right now we've done um, supply and demand assessments using the old buildable lands inventory. So coming back full circle to how useful and um, the many roles that the BLI plays. Um, we've been working with OMSI as a landowner to line up a potential pilot site on their waterfront. We've done financial risk modeling. Um, within the OMSI site itself, we've actually developed a concept design. We have a land appraisal. We have a um, cost estimate of what the project is going to be. 
uh, what what it was going to cost in 2020. I think that's a little out of date. Um, and OMSI, we've been partnering with OMSI to build this into their master planning process. So you have all seen that, um, or we'll see it as part of their central city master plan. And then within that, there's been extensive, it says here tribal engagement, but it really is uh, bigger than tribal engagement. It's Native American engagement uh, through the Native American Advisory Committee that is working with OMSI. So we are kind of, we've got this pilot project lined up. Um, we have sort of done our due diligence and think that this makes a lot of sense here in the city. Um, we also know that the private mitigation market um, hasn't been knocking on the doors here in, in Portland. And part of that is because of a lot of regulatory confusion. Fusion. Part of it is also because of the cost. So we feel like the city really needs to take that first step to help clarify that regulatory confusion, as well as to be able to bear that initial risk. Um, we have a little bit more risk tolerance and we're not in it for profit. So we don't have to necessarily charge as much um, as a private developer may, be, uh, may need to charge. That said, I mean, if we're talking about a cost of a credit for some of these, if you're adding in all of the environmental components and all of the flood storage components, um, we're really talking about something that would be in the range of about $300,000 to $350,000 of credit. That is very comparable to what wetland credits are going for now in the metro area. So that is sort of for folks who are wondering what the market tolerance is, um, we're actually pretty competitive. And then the last slide is what we're doing with next steps. Um, we had a plan to develop this pilot project that involved Bureau of Environmental Services uh, basically funding it as a pilot project. Um, the Bureau's financial situation has changed. So we've actually partnered, no, we haven't partnered, we worked through the commissioner's office to create a mitigation banking finance working group that the commissioner's office is chairing and that has brought together financial experts across the city. Um, we have a couple of alternatives that we're pursuing. And then the next question is going to be, what is the governance structure? So is it a public <coughs> banking system? <coughs> Excuse me. Is it one um, where we work with a nonprofit or is it something where we do the pilot project and step away and let the private market come in? So those are all uh, different governance structures we're exploring. And the third piece, which is not up here, that I know is really important to the PSC in particular, is what are the equity components of this? So mitigation banking um, is ultimately an ecological uh, calculation of making sure that we're replacing lost ecological functions. But what e mitigation banking has not done anywhere in the country, as far as we can tell, is really ask the question is, how, how is the community experiencing that? So what environmental benefits and what ecosystem services to the community are being lost? And where are they being replaced? And which communities, which populations are benefiting from those new environmental benefits and services? Um, we have, BES has a contract right now using actually the consultant that's been working here at BPS, uh, Camille Tremor and our own consultants, and we're, uh, in fact, that's what I was doing right before this meeting, are holding uh, interviews and focus groups with the BIPOC community, the indigenous community, with uh, leaders of different community groups to really understand what are those qualitative components, things like cultural gathering, fishing, ceremony, um, contemplation, um, safety even, um, access, um, education opportunities and how do we capture all of that as part of this mitigation banking development so i want to make sure that folks know that that is very much a piece of what we're exploring and making sure that that's built into how we uh, develop the system moving forward any questions i feel like we talked about we went into the weeds earlier so i didn't want to repeat that commissioner shoe ships
That's exactly right. Uh, if I could respond, thank you. Um, and you heard uh, Jeff Cottle respond to that earlier of how we're creating the system where the ratio is the same if they do it on site and they do it at a mitigation bank. And part of that is because we're building a system that has those guarantees and those assurances. So um, the the look back that we did, we focus on the Columbia slew at 10 years of mitigation uh, that's been required by the city. And we found in a lot of those sites that um, the mitigation was poorly built. It wasn't functioning even from the beginning. Uh, it had died, it had gone into disrepair. In some cases we had lost track of it and it had been redeveloped. So what was supposed to be a mitigation bank had warehouses on it. Um, we know that developers are not restoration experts. And so asking them to even do this on site or do this at a different site or pay somebody else to do it, they're really looking for the, the cheapest way to, to do that. And then they walk away and that obligation walks with them. What this does is it creates permanent protection. So the sites, the mitigation banks work by crowdsourcing impacts. So you get bigger sites, um, more environmental benefits acting together and in concert at a single site. That site has to be permanently protected through conservation easements uh, and legal protections, as well as open space zoning. The zoning protections also have to go along with that. In addition, the cost of the credit includes a cost of a permanent and per, uh, an endowment in perpetuity. And that endowment then pays for the long-term maintenance of that site. And it's typically done by a third party so that the, um, you have this sort of check and balance in how those sites are maintained. And one of the things that we're really really interested in doing is partnering with the indigenous community to be able to build both into the design, the construction, and the long-term maintenance of that site of how we do that to serve the indigenous communities better here in Portland. So, uh, and to do it in a way that's a, more of an enterprise opportunity as well. And that would come with a pot of money to do that. We don't know, an urban environment is a not a typical place to see mitigation banks. And so we really don't know how much money it's gonna to take to maintain those sites in perpetuity. Um, the permitting requirements and the uh, regulatory requirements kind of dissipate after five years, but we're gonna be in it for the long haul to make sure that those functions, if you're replacing an 80 year old tree with a three year old tree, we need to make sure we're, we're in it for the next 77 years. Um, so that's all built into this system. Yes, yes, that's a high focus. Thank you, that was a wonderful interchange. Um, I also, I, I know that I'm sure we have farther to go. I'm also recognizing we have been at it for almost three and a half hours and my brain is beginning to um, dissipate. Uh, and I wonder where we're at and if there's a Closing, please. Yes. Commissioners, yeah, did we have, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think we can, the only thing that was remaining is just our st staff proposed recommended amendments. And I don't think we necessarily, I, I, you, uh, I just would refer you to the attachment B from the uh, memo. And uh, these are generally just kind of technical amendments, but we can go through things. And if anyone has specific questions about them, we can do that in the next session. Um, and yeah, as we, over the next month, if others have recommended amendments, we can also work on those and we can just address all of that together. And if there's any other questions that come up before our next session, but um, this is just primarily, um, a lot of it is based on input from BDS, some additional code changes, kind of technical code changes, and then there's a few mapping changes. So it's it's pretty straightforward what we have here, but i um, happy to add some things too before our next uh, session. Thank you. Is there, Director Diefendorfer, do you? Patricia Diefendorfer for the record. Um, 
I know that it, we've been here a long time and it's getting late and we're probably tired. Um, I, I did, I thought that um, Commissioner Spivak's question about all of the questions and discussion we've had, but are there any potential amendments in any of this? And I, I think that's whether we have the appetite to talk about it at all this evening or if we want to, um, you know, talk about that um, at some future time uh, at the next meeting. But I, I definitely think that is probably a place we would likely need to go next is despite, you know, this is complicated, there's many parts, it's very technical, we've tried hard now to break it down and explain it. Um, but at the end of the day, it is it is a series of, of maps. It is mapping a floodplain, revised mapping, more up-to-date information. It is extending, it is applying different kinds of environmental um, overlay zones with different sets of requirements over you know, some of that area. It's applying a riparian buffer area over some of that area. And, um, you know, I guess the question really is, are there, are there amendments that the commission has in mind? It, you know, the question seems to be about, are we doing enough? Um, but in the context of what we have before, before the commission right now, I guess the question is, is there anything that, you know, that anyone proposes to change? I would say if, if anyone has any strong um, strong ideas of amendments right now, um, we can uh, maybe highlight them. I might also propose in the interest of people needing to leave and get to um, the, the rest of their evening. And the, uh, if we do have uh, officers meetings, um, and as long as we stay sub court, that can be a, a space to, you know, kind of... Um, uh, have a conversation or, or, you know, tease, tease some things out, um, uh, and, and consider them for, uh, for the future conversation when we continue on November 22nd at the PSC meeting. Does that, does that sound, um, acceptable? It's not perfect. It's also late. <laughs> okay. Okay, everyone. Um, I just th we have done a lot this evening, um, and and I know that there's um, there's a lot to digest, and I I'm appreciative of of staff, of um, all of our commissioners, of those who have um, the person who has testified in open signal um, for being here for the long haul. And I'm if I had known we would go half an hour over, I would have given you more than three minutes. Um, I owe you all individually. So. Um, Thank you. I think we will continue this to November 22nd. Um, appreciate you all. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs>